on YouTube. Looks like it's going uh, okay. streaming. Great. We okay. are now live. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It is now 502. I would like to call the uh, Board of Trustees, uh, Altina Library District Board of Trustees meeting to order um, for the month of May. I'd like to start with a roll call. Uh, Trustee Andrews. Here. Trustee Capel. Here. Trustee Clark. Here. Trustee Wilkerson. Here. Great, and that uh, we have all five uh, of the trustees here. So thank you very much for that. Uh, we will now go with the approval uh, and or reordering of the agenda as is currently posted. Do we have any requests to take any of those matters out or rearranged? Okay, seeing none, may I get a motion to approve the agenda as currently posted? Uh, so moved. Great, thank you. Second? I'll second. Great, thank you, Terry. All right, we'll take the agenda uh, to a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. And an aye vote for me. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have the adopted agenda. Are there any uh, public comments on uh, non agenda items? Do not see any public comments at this time now. Great. Thank you, Catalina. All right. Uh, next will be the consent calendar, which is the approval of the minutes from the April 23rd meeting, pages four through eight of your packet. Any discussion on the matter? No. Uh, no. Okay. May I get a motion? Uh, move to approve the consent calendar. Great. Thank you. May I get a second? All second. Great. Thank you, Jason. Okay, uh, we will take the uh, minutes uh, for a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. Thank you very much. I am going to abstain since I was not participating in that particular meeting. Thank you. I did read it. It looked very interesting. Um, you know, I watched some of it. You did a fantastic job. Thank you for running the meeting. So now we will go, uh, there are no other items uh, for consideration of the consent matter since we've approved it as is. So we will now go to the department update reports. Uh, you'll find your packet uh, pages nine through 27 and then very specifically to remove report on pages 28 through 32. Do any of our uh, fellow trustees have any questions or comments of the staff that are here? No. Okay. Seeing none, I just want to thank the staff for the tree removal report. That's never a, a fun report to write, uh, but it is what it is. Uh, you know, we've, uh, so I do appreciate the, the heads up on, on the removal of, of that, uh, that tree. It's, it's sad to see any uh, old growth tree like that had to be removed, but you know, that's, a, that's the circumstances as they are. So uh, seeing there's no other comments or questions, we'll move on then to the next item, which is 5B of your packet. Uh, my Libro app presentation, which starts on page 32 of your, or sorry, excuse me, page 33 of your packet. Nikki, you want to be a presentation on this? Yeah, um, our IT and technical services manager, David Zierbaugh, will be presenting. And Catalina, can you let him share his screen? Hello, board. How are you? Very good. How are you? Good, thank you. Uh, just a moment while I get screen sharing capabilities and then I'll be on my way. Um, Catalina, I'm logged in under two accounts. Would you also give me screen sharing on that other account as yes, well? Yes, I will thank make you, you both co-hosts. Awesome, thank you. Uh, because after this, I'll be sharing what it looks like on the phone version. So one second. All right. All right. So um, here we are. You can see I'm presenting on our, our new uh, Altadena library app called My Libro. There's a little screen grab, grab of what it looks like over there. Um, we'll get to see that in a minute. Um, I prepared this backstory here. 
Um, we were approved or authorized in October of 2021 to contract with um, Conversite um, for an app called My Libro. It was previously the the project was previously titled Third Ray. Um, during that contract, uh, we were provided to provide service and go live within the first year, and then um, we were authorized to sign for two additional years at, thereafter. Um, some of the things that were included in the contract are um, integration with the, the library system, um, which includes uh, account review and catalog searching, um, contact list pickup management, scheduling analytics to go with that, um, self-checkout scanning um, and checking out in-app, uh, event searching, and third-party integrations. Um, so that's the background there. That's what you approved. And then here's our phased implementation and where we're at now. Um, as you know, uh, I started in December of uh, 2021. So uh, tried to move this project forward. And here's what we have so far. We have the full implementation and integration of the My Libre app and co op system that's completed. Um, we've also got our calendar of events, uh, blog, social media for the most part. Live chat is uh, available and then also library FAQs is there. Third phase was the coupon integration. And I think uh, we can talk about that because I know there were some questions about how we were going to integrate that. And, and there was a little bit of a pivot there on what we anticipated doing and then what we ended up doing there. Um, and then right now we're in process of doing the pickup and reservation components, um, also the self checkout components. Um, those are, are very close to being done, and I'll have some news on that shortly. And then the integrations component has uh, proved to be pretty difficult overall, but uh, I know that my Libro has made some great progress, and I'll be happy to share that with you. Um, so here's some of the details. We have it currently available for Google Play and Apple uh, App Store. Um, it allows patrons to log in, manage their account, search for materials, ch um, review checkouts, place hold, perform renewals. Um, has the events integration in there. You can you can view all of the, the events and registration um, has to be done through, you click on a link and then you're able to register through Trumba. Uh, social me media feed, as I mentioned, is there, uh, Facebook and YouTube, but uh, Instagram is pending and they are working toward trying to get that resolved. Um, for some reason, that's giving them a little bit of an issue. As I mentioned, we have our um, read local, shop local, deals uh, displayed in app. We're really excited to, to uh, have that available for our patrons. And then room reservations, pickup appointments and live chat are actually functioning, but um, they need to be added in app. So um, those are available functions. We kind of need to build those out, the, the backbone of those to make sure that they function as, as we'd like. And then um, we'll be ready to, to bring those into the in-app. And then, um, as far as that goes, um, essentially what that just means is we, we need to get our rooms added in there. Um, we need to decide if, if we're going to be doing contactless pickup. I know we really haven't had too many uh, patrons utilizing that. And then for the live chat, we will really want to get that full integration. We're using a different platform for our live chat, and uh, we would really like it to be integrated into the web. So regardless of whether you use the website or you use our app, uh, patrons would get the same user interface and staff would have one. Uh, centralized location to be able to chat with patrons. If we implemented now, we'd have two different live chats and that just doesn't seem like a great uh, implementation overall. So that's, we're waiting on that a little bit. Um, as I meant, mentioned, um, in-app in integrations are really slow, uh, but it looks like Cloud Library, we'll see some success with that. They're moving forward with, with that overall. Hoopla is, has been a little bit slower because uh, Cloud Library is their main focus right now but we're hopeful that they'll be able to do a full in-app integration of Hoopla. I have seen other full in-app integrations with different uh, uh, app platforms So for Cloud Library. So I'm very hopeful that they'll get that going soon. Um, so that's kind of where we're at. Some coming soon stuff. Uh, we have a featured carousel right now, but we'll be able to update that monthly to get um, what we have on our website to match what we have on our app. As I mentioned, room reservation is pretty much there. We just need to build out the rooms and, and set up the settings to make that available. Um, if we did want to do some contactless pickup, we could use this for uh, volunteer shift booking, many other things. It's just an appointment-based system. We, we already have a computer reservation system, but we also could use it to reserve computers, for example. 
Uh, I already talked about live chat. Um, Self-checkout, I'm working with them currently to, to get that working. Uh, they anticipate the, the go live for uh, self-check to be on 6.1, which is very, very soon. Um, so that is our soft launch date, and that is our hope to, to have the self-checkout feature ready to go. Um, and then, like we mentioned, cloud library and, and Hoopla integrations are coming soon. Once we go live with our soft launch, they'll be ready to implement the data analytics and those that will be trying to do more integrations and bring all the data usage into app, whether it's uh, direct in-app use or um, if it's self-checkouts, cloud library checkouts, uh, live chats, and then other things like our, um, our door counters and things like that, bringing those different analytics into the app uh, from the staff interface so that we're able to check that out. All right, so I'm going to now switch over and share my other screen. So bear with me one moment while I do that. I'm gonna stop sharing on one now. And let me go ahead and share on the other one. Okay. And I apologize, you'll see me down at the bottom there. But anyhow, this is what the app looks like here. We have the, the library card at the very top um, below our logo, um, has the name of the library and the account information. If you click on that first thing um, there, that's my pickups, that's an available item that I can pick up. That's that one little, uh, little bag right in the middle that says one. Five is uh, my current hold. So if I click on that one there, I can see what holds I have available. I have a lot of 5G hotspots that I'm working on right now. So you can see that's what my holds are on. And then um, the checkouts, these are my current checkouts there. I have two Oculus uh, devices. And I'm, as I say, I'm working on quite a bit of technology overall. Um, if I wanted to scan my library card, I can hit a, just above where I was at. There's that little barcode looking thing. If I click on that, it'll show my barcode. These will work on the self-checkout machines and our barcode scanners. So you can scan the barcode in app. So if you didn't bring your library card, you could use the app to, to check out on the self-checkout machines and also in person uh, at our main desks. Um, also, if I wanted to review my account information, I can hit the little person on the top right. And then it has uh, my account details at the top. And then also there's some uh, various settings in here. The one thing I do want to point out is the uh, library info. So if I click on that there, it'll show the branch details, the hours, and then also that phone number that they can call. And then you can also switch it to our uh, Bob Lucas library. So let me do that right now. And then you can see the hours there as well. Um, down at the bottom, uh, you can see we have a few different options there. I, I have the chat enabled eventually that will go away, but I do want to feature the search real quick. Um, you have a, diff a couple different types of search options. You can do keyword, title, author, or subject. My preference is uh, keyword overall, but if we just do, for example, a subject search of romance, it'll come up with uh, various titles um, there. You can also do, if you're on the main screen, um, the category searches there, and that's where you'll see um, the topic that I just searched, which is romance, but you can view a list of categories there and then select one. Um, Right now it's searching by subject and we asked them to update it to search by keyword because generally that gets more results. So they'll be doing that uh, by June 1 as well. Um, the live chat as it stands now um, is more of like a AI and they're, they're really gonna be building that out. So this is actually gonna be removed because it just is a little confusing because it says chat and it's not really chat. Eventually it will be taken over by um, by a full AI integration and, and um, but essentially what it does is it allows you to do some basic FAQ kind of things. Um, the self checkout machine, as I say, is not currently working. They're hoping to get it working by six one that's down there at the bottom as well. If I were to click on that now, um, it has the different libraries where you can check out from. And then if you click on this barcode reader, um, it'll show your screen and then I can scan a barcode. Now that wasn't a library book, but you can see there's an error right now. It's not currently working. Um, two other things I'll share with you is our coupons page. And let me move myself down to the bottom. You can see all the different um, 
uh, read local shop local deals here and, and what they are. It also gives you a map. So we're actually not going to be tracking the um, where the, the person's current location is in app. Um, you can also opt in and out in the app itself. But essentially what we're going to do is do a push notification monthly and highlight a new deal. Um, as they come available. And that way we're not needing to track your location in app and we can just um, allow you to kind of guide whether or not you wanna use them. So if I wanted to, to pick one, I would just hit open and that would open up uh, the app for me. Um, and let me go ahead and set my settings uh, there, but you can see it, it should open up for me um, that app um, and, and show me the location. So that's that. And then the last thing I wanted to share is the schedule component. So um, if I wanted to schedule a room reservation, I can click schedule a uh, visit. I would pick my library. You can't see that down there. Sorry, I'm moving myself all over the place. So I picked the main. Um, and then you can see the, the small study room became available. So I have that selected in the middle and then I can choose an appropriate date and time. So I'm gonna go ahead and check tomorrow and looks like it shows the, the hours that it's available. So I'm gonna go ahead and click 10 um, and then I'll hit continue. And then it shows my summary and I'll hit confirm and now I have a, a visit available. Um, so now I'm back at the home screen. And if I go back to um, schedule, give it one second to load here. All right, so now you can see my visits there and I can manage my visit. So if I wanted to cancel it or reschedule, I can do that from there. Um, this is something, as I say, we're, we're working toward getting set up. Right now we have the small study room available, but we just need to, to set up the full infrastructure to put it in place. Um, I believe that's all I have for you today and I'm happy to answer any questions. Well, yes, David, right. thank you very much for that presentation. It's very exciting. A lot of neat stuff there. Uh, any questions uh, from my fellow trustees or comments? Um, yeah, David, this is Terry. Uh, my my image isn't coming on for some reason, but uh, I trust you can hear me okay? I can. Okay. Um, that is very impressive. And as I recall, it took us a couple of sessions as a board to get this finally passed and everything. So. Are we still in the sort of early beta testing stages with that company on this thing? Is that what's happening? So we're in beta process right now. I think at this point, it's at the, the, the level where we're ready to do a soft launch to start having our, um, we've had our staff already test it and they've given us a bunch of things to work on. And now we're, we're at the point where we've resolved enough of those that we'd like to, to start to open it up to the public, get some initial feedback from them. And then from there, um, kind of start to advertise it uh, system wide. It's very impressive. And uh, again, thanks for the good work on that. Another question I had related to your report at the very beginning that you was in the, the printed report in our packet, you talked about passwords being changed library wide. And it said passwords will now be updated quarterly with the next scheduled change on July the 1st. And it occurred to me, I've never seen anything about passwords and that sort of basic library security. So is that you know, a more robust schedule for password changing than we had before? Yes, that's correct. This is actually not related to the app. So I just wanted to make sure that's clear for the, for the board and for the public. Um, but yes, uh, we, we didn't have a password schedule before. They were changed, but there was never a schedule put in place. Um, I've worked for many government entities and, and the goal overall is to, to continue to update passwords uh, pretty frequently. Quarterly seems to be the standard. So my goal uh, was to make sure that we, we do that just to make sure that as people come and go, uh, the passwords do not remain the same. So it doesn't compromise any system. So yes, that's a newer thing that well, we put in place. That's terrific. I felt more secure when I read that in the packet. <laughs> And so good work. I appreciate that. That's a big deal, you know, in, in all companies and institutions. Thank you. Any other comments? David, I just have a bit of a random question. This is Jason. Um, I have no recollection of setting up a pin when I got my library card. So I don't, is there some way, like, what's the best way for folks that are in my same position to like figure that out? Whatever. Yeah, it's it, it's generally the last four digits of your phone number. 
So that that's usually the easiest way. That's what we generally set it to whatever phone number you okay. have on file. Um, I don't recall. I think if you, you there is a fa uh, password recovery through our, our catalog site. I'm looking at it now, um, but it does require an email address because we would email you your uh, updated information. So if you didn't have that, you can either come to the library um, with your ID and we can help you reset it. Or um, I'm sure you can call in as well. And if we can verify a few different things, we can get that corrected. But generally the last four of your phone number is what we use for your, your library card pin. If I, if I may, um, Go ahead. this, David, this looks great. Like it really, really looks good. And I am so excited about all the different things that people can do that are not impossible to do on the website, but definitely like can be challenging, um, especially if you're trying to navigate it on the phone. Um, so I think this is super exciting. I did have a question for you about just basically data privacy stuff. So in the course of you know building out this app and as users download it what kind of measures are, are you all taking on the data privacy front to make sure that you know if we are collecting data that patrons are opting in or that they're clear or that they know what that is or do you know what i mean like i want to i want to make sure that folks feel like it's transparent and accessible and they can get their data at any time if they want it or you know that nobody else can see it that kind of stuff Sure. Um, I'd have to talk to uh, Congress site specifically about what data is collected through the app, but I can tell you that um, your personal information isn't necessarily kept in app for like the library components of it. Um, mm -hmm. The way that it works is it, it connects via via SIP, um, which is a, um, a connection protocol. And so it's just literally passing on information to the library system and, and then um, retrieving results from the library system. So oh, interesting. Okay. In, in that sense, that's a lot of times what happens with like a self-checkout machine does the same kinds of things. They don't keep the information stored at the self-checkout machine right. the same way a, a library app wouldn't. It retrieves information from other places and then displays it to you in app. Uh, again, I'd have to check with Converse on what specifically is stored, but generally that's that's the protocol that happens either during a self-checkout or when I'm displaying to you on a self-checkout machine the holds that are available or the same thing in app. If you have holds available, it's retrieving that information and displaying it in app, but it doesn't necessarily like store it in app for you. Right, right. So maybe one one thought is on that like user profile screen or someplace else that makes sense maybe we just add a little thing that's like my data and you know kind of an explainer about where people's information is that hey it all lives in the library system we're not putting a bunch of stuff on your phone just because I, I know people are increasingly concerned about where their info is and if i lose my phone you know does how does that work and all of that i think it might be worth doing because i i feel like this has so much utility i think a ton of people are going to download it Okay. Yeah. Thank you for that feedback. I'll, I'll definitely go, go to con for site and see what we can do about that. Thanks. Great question. Camila, you had your hand up. Yep. I was just going to kind of echo what um, folks have said. I, I downloaded it and played around with it a little bit and it looks pretty number one. And then it also, it looks, very functional. I'm, I'm pretty excited about that in terms of not having to log on to um, the website or through my phone to be able to access um, things and, and easily having my library card stored there. I have to have a little spreadsheet with the different library card numbers I have and it just makes things nice and easy, everything all in one place. So, so far it's looking really good. I'm, I'm excited and looking forward to using it. Thank yeah, I, I echo what you say as well, uh, Camila, and, and I, much like J Jason, I, I tried to access it, but I didn't have the PIN number either, so I'll have to get that. Um, just a quick question um, for the future. When we have our second um, van and we're looking to potentially move towards a home delivery, certainly when we start going through our construction, will we have a feature on that that will enable the, to schedule or uh, some sort of delivery? Uh, that's a great question. I don't think that's something that we've thought out at this point, but um, 
definitely with the appointment functionality uh, and the um, booking assets functionality, we can we can incorporate those types of things. It, it's obviously there's some work that has to go in on the back end to put that in place, but the, these systems are already built out. We would just have to kind of figure out how that should work, and then and then build those into the the appointment booking or the reservation booking systems. Yeah, it seems pretty robust that it would be fairly easy to do. Um, so just planting the seed for, for the future, because I know that at some point we're going to be wanting to have that option. So great. Uh, well, David, thank you very much for that great presentation. You can tell we're all very, very excited as to this technology and where we're going with this. So well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, next on our agenda is the Summer Reading Program Report. Hi, everyone. I will be giving the summer reading report. Um, so I'm going to share my screen. Basically, this is the PowerPoint that was included in the package, but I will share my screen so we can review together. Okay. So summer reading this year starts on June 4th and runs through July 31st. And in true Altadena Library fashion, we have a ton of events planned for almost every day, every week of those two months. Um, but I won't get into the events um, because that would be really information overload if I were to try. Um, but we will have all of this um, in calendar form or magazine style, depending on um, the program or the age group, and this will all be available for pickup soon at the library and, of course, on our events calendar. Um, and I'm going to start to go through the presentation just to give um, like a very brief like overview of what the actual challenge is. Um, so we're going to start with a kickoff event on June 4th. That is a Saturday from 2 to 6.30. Uh, where families can drop in or stay in for the whole entire time if they want to. Starting at two, we have a live performance by Ballet Folklorico. Um, from three to five, families can sign up for summer reading, enjoy ice cream and play outdoor games or crafts, whatever we have going on. And then from five to 6.30, we will wrap things up with a live performance by Michael Hagens and his band. Okay, so the challenge. So for babies and toddlers, um, their challenge is basically they will sign up for summer reading. They will receive a free book and a reading log. They read 24 books that counts as completing the challenge and they can earn two prizes and be entered into the end of the summer drawing. Of course, this is based on how much they participate because there's also events that we'd like them to come to as well as reading. Um, but all of that is showcased in their log where they can track all of this. Um, but that's it in a nutshell um, on how babies and toddlers can earn prizes. For pre-K through sixth grade, um, we are asking that they sign up for summer reading. Again, they will receive a free book and a badge activity booklet because they can also track their reading and activities in Beanstack. Um, if they read for 500 minutes, that will count as completing their reading challenge. And then there's also an assortment of activities um, for all children throughout this age group that they can complete to earn prizes as well. And there is an end of the summer drawing for them as well after they earn 17 badges in Beanstack, but they can also track it with their physical log that they can pick up at the library. Teens is doing something a little different this year, but I think it's super cool. Um, basically, it's like a teen volunteer program where for every five hours of service they give, then they can earn some swag, whether it be a mug or a tote bag or Whatever, we have an assortment of things that they can earn, but for every five hours, they can get one of those prizes. Um, and of course, we'd like them to attend team events as well that are available throughout the summer. 
including things like a gardening club, tween eats, chess night, and so much more. Last but not least for adult services, they sign up for summer reading. They will actually also receive a free book and they can log reading minutes. The goal is 500 minutes and they can complete activities. They don't have to do both. They can just choose to read and let that be their challenge or they could just do the activities and that could be their summer challenge or they could do both. But whatever you do earns you a prize if you complete it, whether it's reading or activities. And we do have a physical way of tracking that as well. If adults don't want to use Beanstack or are not familiar with it, I will say since David just presented, it reminded me that he did a wonderful job adding Beanstack to all of the card catalog computers at the library so that staff can easily walk a patron over um, at their leisure and just help them sign up or tell them how. Um, and we can gladly again walk over and assist them with that. Um, so that is adult services challenge in a nutshell. And again, lots of fun activities. I'm most excited about um, two murder mystery events that we have planned. One is murder at Mardi Gras. So of course, you know, I had to throw a little sprinkle of my culture in there. So just really, really excited about all the wonderful things the staff has planned. And then when all those fun events are said and done, we're gonna wrap things up with a summer finale. So for adults, it's gonna end um, on Friday, July 29th. That is from seven to nine with a live performance by the Susie Hansen Latin Band. That's at the main library. Then for Youth and Family Services, the team, they are gonna have a finale event the following day on Saturday, July 30th from two to four. And there will be games, crafts, karaoke, all kind of fun stuff happening for the teens from two to four on Saturday. And of course, we can't leave out the kids. They are also wrapping things up on Saturday, July 30th from 1.30 to 2.30, and that is with a live performance by Noteworthy Puppets, and they will be presenting the three little points for us. Um, so before I wrap up, oh, I skipped a slide, and I don't know how to do that. Okay. Um, so, there we go. So yes, that is summer reading. We're super excited about it. Um, even though these events are the quote unquote finale, you still can pick up prizes after these dates. We're allowing an additional two weeks for um, everyone to come by and pick up prizes, but tracking your reading and activities will end on those dates. Um, so that is summer. But during summer, there are other wonderful things that are happening. We will be celebrating Pride Month, and we will kick off that celebration on Saturday, June, June 11th. Um, there will be a kickoff event at the main library, and then um, Nick Arzen is taking whoever wants to participate on a walking tour, and they're going to many different stops, but their first stop is at the main library. We also have story times that week that will be pride themed. Really all of the events happening that week for children are pride themed, including um, an LGBTQ bingo event. So that is how we're celebrating pride. Of course, we will have a carousel on the website. We have displays inside the library and we will also be, um, I think we have a flag that will be on display outside. And if we were able to pull it off, I haven't confirmed with staff, but there's supposed to be an art exhibit as well. That is how we're celebrating Pride. Juneteenth also takes place during the summer. And the way we're celebrating is with a presentation. We've partnered with the Altadena Historical Society 
to share a presentation called The History of African Americans in Altadena. We will do that on Saturday, June 18th from 2 to 3.30 in the community room at the main library. We will also have a special story time and craft on Friday, June 17th from 4 to 5 p.m. And just so you know, um, this is not an event, but we thought it was worthy of sharing. ALD staff worked really hard to create a Wikipedia entry for Ellen Garrison Clark. As you know, last year we celebrated Ellen Garrison Clark um, with a tombstone or a headstone. Um, and that was something the Altadena Historical Society did. And at the event on June 18th, they will also be giving away a scholarship in Ellen Garrison Clark's name. So we're excited about that as well. And I believe that concludes my presentation. Thank That's you. it? That's all there is? That's, that's wonderful. There that's could cool. be more, a, lot going, a lot going on. So thank you. Uh, questions, comments? Camila, you have your hand up. I, I it was supposed to be a little applause emoji, oh. but uh, <laughs> not, not really my hand. Uh, but thank you. It looks really exciting. I've already put a few of those events in my phone calendar. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, as I was listening, I was kind of combining yours and, and David's with a, I had a question for the, the summer reading. Is there going to be a way to track that on the app? Is that I can a possibility? That. We, we're, we're working on it right now with a uh, Conversite. It's something that they're really excited about. Um, they just started partnering with Beanstack and they would love to get it off the ground. Unfortunately, it looks like with all the other things that they have in progress, it might be a little too much on their plate. Um, but I know that that is one of the big ones that they're looking to integrate in the future. And we're really excited for them to, to start on that. But probably for this summer reading, we won't be ready, but I think, you know, if we can partner with them to get it started, I know we'd love to, to get that going so it can all be in app. So hopefully next summer, we'll cross our fingers. Thank you. I think Any it's safe questions? to assume, David, that every program, everything we do going forward is gonna be followed with, can I do that on my app? <laughs> of course. And ho hopefully we'll be able to get there. <laughs> there you go. Yes. Any other questions or comments uh, from Ashley's presentation? No, just a congratulations from me. It looks like a really good program. And uh, yeah. so it's gonna, I, I, I bet there's a little pent up demand out there too for this summer for getting kids out of the house and to somewhere else. So I think that's going to add to the success of the program. Great, great. Jason? I was just going to just mention too, I don't remember i mean maybe i'm still in like the covid fog or something you know two years of nothing happening but i, I don't remember us doing this much these many public events to launch everything i, I think it, it's yeah it's pretty amazing it's exciting stuff agree very comprehensive so well done well done Okay, uh, seeing no other questions or comments, we'll move on. Thank you very much, Ashley. Appreciate the presentation. Now we will go on to uh, um, the reports. So we've got first up, we've got the uh, support groups from first is the Altina Library Foundation. I do not see Bridget has joined us, I don't believe. Yeah, so, Bridget. Yeah. Oh, sorry. She oh. probably texted both of us. Go ahead, Nikki. Yeah, yeah <laughs> she had a, an event at her grandson's school, so she's not able to make it. But okay. um, looking through her report, the couple things I would highlight are um, congrats to the foundation for getting another Tournament of Roses grant for $10,000 for us. Thank you to Rushmore and Bridget and Jonathan will be representing us on Wednesday to accept that check. Um, they also have a donor appreciation event on Sunday, June 12th. So if you're not a donor, become one. And then you can go to these really fun events at the library with us as well as obviously in full planning mode for Taste of Dina. Get that on your calendar, Saturday, September 24th. So this year's not on your birthday, Katie. So hopefully, yeah, we're not infringing on your birthday celebration. It's gonna be we'll just see like there. the best weekend ever. Best weekend, for sure. <laughs> so that's what I would say. And I don't think, 
Sally's here either. <laughs> I don't see Sally or Tom. <laughs> yeah. So I will point out, um, Rushmore and I met uh, about a year ago when Katie was president, we started doing quarterly meetings with the presidents. So trustees, the friends and the foundation and myself. And we brought both Sally and their on incoming president, Tom Rufner, and met with the five of us last week, which was great. Um, they had their big annual book sale this past weekend. And Jonathan, who's in the room, also said there was like 40 people in line before it even started. So obviously people were dying for a book sale, honestly. So like good luck parking. It was a very, very busy weekend. So I, I definitely think people were ready for that. I'll also highlight that um, the Friends annual meeting, their annual membership meeting is their June meeting. So that's taking place on June 7th, which is a Tuesday night at six, I think. Oh my gosh, I don't have it written down. Yeah, my meeting with them is usually at six. So that'll be at the main library and they're actually having Sally's husband speak. Um, his talk is titled Searching for Water Life on Other Planets. So it should be really interesting. And I've heard he's a very entertaining guy. So hopefully um, lots of friends, members will be there. And if you're not a member, join. It's only $10. And then you get into the book sale early. Uh, anything else you would add? No, Rushmore? just. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. Nope. <laughs> I was a no anyway. <laughs> Got yeah. it. No. <laughs> No, I'll only say that if maybe Sally's husband find water here in Southern California, and <laughs> well, the plant's great, but you can go water here. Um, great. Well, thank you for channeling both uh, Sally and Bridget there, Nikki. So got it. Got it. you've got the floor now. So we've got the director's report. So let's just uh, keep going. So yeah. yeah, good evening, trustees, staff, and members of the public. Hope you all had a great weekend and are enjoying this beautiful weather. Oh my gosh, love it. Um, my husband's last day of work is Wednesday. So we were celebrating him. It was, it's been bittersweet because he's been, he's been at his job for 25 years. So lots of sad customers to see my husband leave, but I'm in Las Vegas right now and we're moving down Saturday. So that's exciting. Um, I also wanted to send, uh, kudos to David. That app looks awesome in my opinion. And it really is revolutionary in the fact that like you're going to stay in the app to access all of those things. Never seen a library app like it before. And I did want to give him um, recognition for how much he's built in staff feedback into the process. Like we got the first iteration, I would say back in like January and staff have been playing with it and providing feedback to make sure it's as functional as possible. So we wanted to share it with the board before we even soft launched. So after tonight, here we go, we'll see how it goes. But I, I did wanna give him congratulations publicly. Um, also lots of love to Ashley and the public services staff. They've put in a lot of time and energy into planning summer reading. Um, with Ashley coming out of children's services right before this position, I think it's like near and dear to her heart um, to have a really solid summer reading program. And I think that's going to be to the benefit of all ages now that she's the assistant director. So kudos to her and all of the staff that have really worked hard to have an amazing summer reading program coming. Okay, so moving on, as I mentioned last month, we are so excited to welcome Danielle Galvan Gomez uh, to the Bob Lucas team. She started in her full-time position with us on Monday, May the 2nd. Um, and is getting acquainted with uh, the community and the tasks in this full-time role. Uh, so she's doing a great job, really excited about that. And she's in library school too. So juggling a lot and doing a great job. So congrats to her. Um, I mentioned last month that we were hiring two new library clerks, one for youth and family services. That's gonna work closely with our teen librarian, Isabel Briggs to help support her as well as um, replacing Danielle in adult services. They actually both started today. So that was great. Um, I'll have more information and I'll share their pictures and all of that with you guys next month. But that means we're not hiring right now. I know, I just wanna say hooray. That's like the first time I've been able to say that in a long time. So yay. Um, I also wanted to say congratulations to our Bob Lucas branch manager and literacy coordinator, Diana Wong on her selection as the two, 2022 Outstanding Librarian in Support of Literacy Award. Woo. Woo, I know. Good. Congratulations. 
in the whole state. Yay. Um, so she'll be attending CLA the end of next week to receive the award, which is really cool. The conference is taking place in Sacramento. As I mentioned in my report, Diana has been especially innovative during the global pandemic. Uh, during the last two years to provide these like necessary services, even when it had to be done remotely or when it had to be done outside in a socially distanced manner. Uh, her and her staff have really been adaptive to try to meet the needs of their learners and largely because they care and they want to make sure that these people feel supported and are getting the like language and literacy learning needs uh, fulfilled. Uh, I know she's going to be continue to be innovative as we move towards closing buildings and figuring out what that's going to look like and maybe building in literacy services through the van as well. So congrats to Diana. I'm so excited for her and a well-deserved award. So thank you. Um, special tax mailer. That's not as fun as Diana's topic, but um, the tax mailer went out the last week of April. And to be honest, I think it's been very smooth. We were talking about that this morning at the facilities committee. I've had several residents reach out mainly for information on how to apply for the low income exemption. Uh, we do have a page on the website, either you can link to it through the next chapter page or just altadinalibrary.org slash special tax lien, one word, provides all of the information as well as the application to apply for the exemption. If any of you get questions or if people need additional information, please feel free to send them my way. If I can't answer their questions, I'm referring them to MBS, but we want to make sure everybody has the ability to apply for the exemption that is able to. Uh, the deadline for that is June 30th. So again, so far so good. Um, and if you, if you have anyone with questions, please send them my way. Uh, in terms of statistics, as I pointed out, the most notable number that like went through the roof this month was the Bob Lucas uh, visitor count. Thank goodness for technology. We've now automated that count, but it does show you how much the staff go in and out the door. So at this point, I think a fair assessment is to probably divide it by four. And that's probably like the more accurate number. But I think as time goes on, we'll see that's just like the consistent number um, of people going in and out the door. Cause like at, at Maine, we've always had the door counter. So that's been built into those statistics, you know? So again, I just wanted to point that out cause I was like, whoa, that's gotta be a typo. So I, I did some exploring there. Uh, we have also seen a trend in electronic checkouts reducing as physical checkouts have been increasing over the last few months. I have been working with David, our IT and technical services manager and Ashley to assess what we're purchasing, especially in a digital format, to make sure that we're buying, even if we need to buy more copies of what is popular, um, as well as like these platforms have reports that you can generate that show like what you don't own, but you should based on like what's popular. So again, as we're moving towards renovating and people having access largely through um, the virtual worlds, we'll continue to assess and make sure that we're purchasing what people really wanna check out. Um, so programming just keeps increasing, as you can see. Uh, this month, we celebrated Asian American Pacific Islander Heritage Month, both with programs and feature collections, both online and in the, in the library. It's also Mental Health Awareness Month, and we're offering programs to enlighten and encourage positive mental health practices. That includes um, Zoom meditation, which I know sounds a little weird, but honestly, it's amazing. Just like close all your windows and your blinds and like lay down. Um, we still have two more of those meditation sessions. Those are tomorrow, Tuesday, and then the following Tuesday night at seven o'clock. So highly recommend um, the instructor, Amy Rutledge. She's done it for us a couple of times in the past. Very popular, um, as well as several other programs. I already talked about the Friends Book Cell being very successful, which was great. I did want to thank Jason for his flexibility on second Saturday, um, not this past Saturday, but the week before we had a power outage and we went from like no concert to like 30 minutes later having a concert and Jason ran right down to the library to introduce and we ended up having 180 people show up. So I'm really glad that we let the program go on and it was it was well attended. Um, that night, we also had an artist reception for um, artist Dale Volker right now. His exhibit is called Moving Color. I can't tell you how many people have said to me this is the best art exhibit the library's ever had. So if you haven't made it down to check it out, I would highly recommend it. 
I've already been like, can I afford that? I don't know. But anyway, his art is amazing and it's on display through May 30th. Um, and join us for our last second Saturday of the season. That's going to be on June the 11th with Upstream, who I have yet to see because of the pandemic. And I heard they're like amazing and the most popular band. So I, I'd highly encourage everyone to come. And thank you to Camila. I believe she's going to be doing the introduction for us. So um, that's all I have, which is probably enough. I know we have a big agenda tonight. So I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Very comprehensive as usual. Thank you. Any questions or comments? No. I mean, Very just thorough. another quick shout out to, I mean, another quick shout out to Diana. I think it's one more on the long list of amazing things that our small but mighty Altadena Library pull off. And, you know, the statistic that popped out from the Bob Lucas report, I mean, over 55 hours of volunteer time with the Literacy Center last month. It, I mean, I, I'm, I just can't wait to see where that goes when we finish the work on expanding the Bob Lucas branch and creating an actual literacy center. Yeah, such a good point, Jason, thanks. Thank you for that, Jason. Okay, next will be the uh, financial report. everyone. Um, can everybody hear me okay? Can you give me a quick nod? Sure can. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to see you all today. Uh, the following are the district's unaudited March 2022 financial reports. Uh, this marks us at 75% of its fiscal year. Um, and so I'll go ahead and jump right in. Referencing page 65, line 6, column B. Gross revenue year to date reflects at 3.875 million. Moving on to page 66, line 65, column B. Uh, we are reporting 2.8 million in gross um, expenses. And this will net us out on line 66, column B at 1.07 million for the year. Um, on to assets on page 70 of our balance sheet, line 11. Cash and investments see a really big increase. Uh, we're reporting um, $26.5 million. Um, this is due to receiving our bond proceeds in March. So that's why you see the big increase there. But I do wanna note uh, while we're all on this call that the $23.3 million in bond proceeds are considered restricted cash only to be used toward the renovation. So. In terms of liquid cash, we're reporting at $3.2 million. Um, cash with accounting is $2.971 million, satisfying our district policy of six months of operating expenses and reserves. Total assets on line 21 reflect that $30.18 million. Um, in terms of revenue highlights, uh, we're at 99% of target revenues, uh, but I really am um, Happy to report that we've met our budget line items for lines two and four for property tax and interest respectively. Um, so safe to say we'll be finishing out the year strong in terms of revenue. Um, on line three, fines and fees. Uh, this is primarily our passport services and that's uh, $7,000. Uh, that's one and a half times, uh, one and a half times higher than reported in February. Um, so as we kind of see people starting to get the travel itch as uh, you know, the pandemic worries are, are sort of dissipating, so to speak. Um, on line five, other revenue, we're reporting $8,000 in uh, film rental. So additional income to, to the library. So happy to see that as well. Um, another thing to celebrate on page 67, we'll, where you'll see our donations and grants. On line seven, column D, you'll see that the district received uh, $250,000 for expanding our footprint. Uh, this is grant funding uh, given to us by California State Library. Um, these funds will be exhausted in the upcoming fiscal year of 2022-2023, um, just because we received it at the tail end. We're hoping to uh, get another van with this money and two vending machines um, and the support that those uh, new assets will, will need using this $250,000 grant. Um, and now moving on to expenses. Um, page 65 on line 11, we see a uh, decrease in $11,000 for hourly employees. 
Um, this is primarily due to having an employee retire in February. Uh, so the payout for the time off um, kind of set us up a little higher. So I just did want to speak to that as we do see a significant decrease this month. Um, on line 40, we see a $6,000 increase. This is primarily due to my training. Um, I started in March. Uh, so I really spent some time with me to just make sure I was prepared for my role. Um, they've done a really great job and been a really huge support uh, throughout the process. Um, we also had management development training uh, that contributed to this increase. And on page 66, on line 57, library materials is at 78% spending. We do plan on exhausting this budget um, by the end of the fiscal year. Um, and on line 64, we see an increase in programming of about $2,700 over February. And this is due to some additional programming on our, on our teen, teens department. Um, they offered a landscape and puppetry workshop um, that contributed to that increase there. Uh, moving on to the CFD funds on page 68, expenses combined to be approximately $429,000. This is predominantly due to bond issuance consulting expenses. And I did want to speak to the budget to actual cost variances. You'll see that they're pretty high. And part of this is due to the budget being repurposed. This was originally intended to just reflect the general fund lending um, for the capital fund expenditures that were coming up uh, to secure the $23.3 million received. Um, this budget wasn't exactly intended to reflect all costs related to closing out these bonds. This type of funding was new to the district, so it made it really hard to approximate at the time of the budget. What they were able to say is they, they anticipated uh, lending this amount. And so I'm happy to report this amount has been reimbursed to general funds in April. Um, and that reimbursement amount was $265,000. So everything's even keeled in terms of reporting with our restrictive funds and also reimbursing the general funds for for that um, advance, so to speak. And that concludes uh, March Financial. I'm happy to address any questions that you may have. Great, thank you for that report, Anna. Any questions or comments of Anna? Terry, um, you're on mute. Anna, we'll stick with the capital fund uh, p &L right now. And that is, you've got, you had an explanation in your, in your cover page about how that that uh, big item there, the big uh, expense was covered and so on. But I see you're starting to add categories here. There's architect expenses that I think are in here for the first time. And I'm wondering also if we going forward can break out, you know, the legal funds and some of the other smaller expenditures so that we can see exactly what those are costing us. Right now, I think that you've got them wrapped up in bond insurance uh, issuance consulting and you explain that. But is it possible going forward that you can itemize that stuff now? Yes, that's absolutely possible. We could provide more of a detailed breakdown. Um, so thank you, thank you for that feedback. We'll um, we'll be sure to add that so that way it um, it's it's more transparent in terms of interpretation. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. Great. Right, anyone else? Okay, seeing none. Anna, thank you very much for the presentation. Okay, next. Let's see here. Okay, now we've got uh, the board trustees standing committee reports. Uh, uh, obviously, we've got the budget committee here, and we're going to be hearing uh, quite extensively about the uh, the next fiscal year's budget. So I'm not sure, Katie, if you have any additional comments now. Or no, wait every, yeah, let's wait till the, the action items. Everything's in the report. So. Yep. Yep, exactly. Thank you. Uh, Terry, anything uh, relative to the CFD committee? You're on mute, Terry. Terry, you're on mute. Terry, you're on oh, mute. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm not very trouble with my computer here. Um, we won't have any uh, me a meeting until June the 8th, so I'll have a report in the next, uh, in the next session. Great. Okay, thank you, Terry. Okay, uh, now we've got the facilities committee. Uh, report jason sure um as usual i'll just touch on uh, some of the key updates um i think one as a reminder to folks uh you know our work around the main library as far as design side of it and community engagement is on hold uh, as we await 
um, hearing back on the grant that we have applied for through the state library. Uh, but with that said, there's a lot of the very necessary and important behind the scenes work, as you can see in the report that is continuing to be done. So as soon as we know about that grant, we can go up, go full steam ahead. Um, same with the Bob Lucas, there's just a lot of this, you know, I think I, I'll speak for myself this is a huge learning curve. Never again will I question like these big government projects and how come there's, there's oh, takes so long to do and the budgets and blah, blah, blah. And then you start seeing even for such small, relatively in grand scheme of things, small projects, just how much you have to go through with these public projects, right? Um, so the one other thing I do want to touch on and just mention, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, as part of our due diligence, we're trying to have, you know, these kind of check-in meetings well in advance with the county planning department. One of the things that we're working on right now is they've initially said that we would need a conditional use permit for, for Bob Lucas, which for everybody on our team does not make sense because we're not changing the use of the building. So um, we are continuing to work with the county and um, as you see in the report, uh, Catherine Barger's office, just to make sure we're, we're clear and we understand what exactly that means and what exactly that's going to require of us. Um, hoping that we can get through that without any further delays um, in, in the Bob Lucas uh, process as well. Um, the other thing there's uh, that's in here that we wanted to just mostly get in here for the rest of the board to see is uh, an updated cost estimate and some slightly more detailed uh, design, not design, but kind of out, outlines of the Bob Lucas expansion. Um, there's just some more details in there, you know, just what some thoughts are on what the, possible you know, interior layout could be um, just starting to fill in the blanks. Uh, you will notice um, the current cost estimate for, for Bob Lucas is 2.7 million. Um, what I'll say is uh, in our meeting this morning, Katie asked a very pertinent question. I'm sure a lot of you have the same question is, you know, we, we keep updating these uh, cost estimates and, you know, when are they going to become the final cost estimate? Um, and and the short answer on that is once we've put out to bid for construction and we does and we select a firm based on their bid, that's when that number becomes permanent, right? So a lot of this is really just updating as we go through the process so that we can make sure that whatever we eventually vote on as a board for both libraries that we're we're within budget. So questions or comments? Colleagues? Or Katie, anything you wanted to add? Anything I did, missed? No, I think you covered it. Cool. Terry? Oh, well, uh, actually, oh, sorry, go ahead, Terry. I'll say my thing later. Oh, you go, okay. You, you I was just gonna say the reason that, I just wanted to clarify the reason the conditional use permit thing exists is because the library was built before the current conditional use permitting system was in place. So basically its construction predates the need for a CUP. And for that reason, we feel like it should be grandfathered in um, because the use is not changing, but that's that's why it that's why it's popping up. And because of the um, you know, the amount of square footage that we would be adding, that's what triggered it. So I just wanted to be clear on that. It's it's not like you know, some weird new rule. It's just because it's an old building and it never had a CUP in the first place. Terry, you don't mind, I'm just gonna just a quick follow up to that. So because of the age of this building, are are we going to be tripped up in any kind of uh, uh, current requirements, uh, bringing it completely up to code? Are, are there any kind of variances at this point? Uh, or are we, we have to bring everything up to current code completely? So, I mean, this is why we have like, a whole team of people looking at all of this for for exactly these reasons yeah. but you know there are very when you're updating a building 
you know, as you know, there are all these various code requirements about like, if it's an old building, you have to do certain things on like solar panels or green energy or whatever. It's a new building, you have to do other things. So I know that our, our architecture team has all of those I's dotted and T's crossed. Um, and we do have the CEQA consultants who are looking at some some elements as well, just to their their belief is that we should probably be exempt from pretty much you know the majority requirements and those that aren't we would be of course building into the plans but that's also why we're kind of doing all of these pieces now before we finalize the designs to make sure that there aren't any surprises um and i, I will right. say we're working with the county to try to figure out a, a more streamlined way to go about the cup process right. uh, thank you for that and it's just really important for people that are watching this and, and are interested in, in not only the designs but the cost you know because you can go into it with the best intentions and costs but there are many things that are completely out of our control and that's why you have a, yeah. a whole list of of team members trying to figure this thing out to keep keep the the modifications to a minimum therefore reducing the cost or keeping them at, at bay so but appreciate that uh terry well i'm just gonna make a comment and i'm sure everybody knows this but i think it's going to be really important given the little fits and starts that are already happening with the scheduling and so on for us to stay on the same page about when certain monies get released and so on, because you'll see a little later when we talk about where the CFD will park its money for investment purposes, there's deadlines and things like that that we need to kind of build into the way we're dispersing money for the project. So just, I know we all know that, but just a little reminder about that. Thank you for that. Any other uh, questions or comments? Okay, great. Thank you very, very much for that report. Uh, Camila, do you have a report on redistricting? Yep. Hi. The report is as it is in the packet. Um, there's not really, I see an error. I will point out it's, we're slated to begin January 2023 um, instead of January 2022. Um, we did successfully have a meeting with Doug a couple of weeks ago and we're able to um, basically just take the last proposed schedule that we worked on and adapt it to the the new coming year. Um, and so hopefully, if all goes as planned, we will start the process for redistricting um, in July of 2023. Um, I believe that we'll have more uh, report or information for this group. Um, I believe we're meeting on November, 2nd, uh, November 4th. Um, to basically, you know, talk about starting the process as well as some other fine details. Um, but that's all we have to report at this time. Great. Thank you for, for that, Camila. Any questions or comments for Camila? No? Seeing none? Thank you very much for that. Okay. Um, now we have the liaison reports. I know we, we had Nikki read into the uh, the record, the reports from the friends in the foundation. Uh, Katie or Camila, do you have any other further uh, comments to add on top of what was already stated in the reports? Nothing for me. No, no. okay, great, thank okay. you. And we, have, and we have no other trustee reports, so now we'll get into uh, item seven of our agenda, which is unfinished business. Um, and just maybe just a quick pause from, as you know, uh, colleagues, we've got a rather long agenda. This Now we're getting into the meat of it. So uh, just, you know, it's 610 right now. So just uh, if at some point you need to take a quick break, please, uh, you know, just let me know and we'll take a break. We'll, I mean, I'll check in maybe at seven and see what, how we're doing. So, but I just want to be mindful of, I know they've got quite a bit of, uh, of actions to, to consider going forward. So with that, uh, we've got uh, 7A, which is a review and approval of uh, to invest uh, the bond proceeds with LAFE. Uh, resolution 2022-07. This was uh, uh, an action that was originally in, in the April uh, meeting, but was continued with a request for additional information. I see we've got Doug Anderson with us. So um, we we'll could go to page 94 of our report and we'll go from there. So I believe we'll turn over to Nikki or are we turn over to Doug, Nikki? Yeah, I'll just, I'll just say that um, last month, the question was raised about um, if we could put some of the proceeds into treasury, knowing that it's a higher interest rate of return, and then maybe some with um, LAFE because there's an easier ability to pull out of there without like stating exactly what the schedule is of pulling down the proceeds. So I talked to Doug, asked him to put together and update the report, and he's here 
with us tonight. Thank you, Doug. So I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Nikki. Good evening, everybody. Um, mm -hmm. Quick background, as you know, we closed the bond issue back in March. Uh, total project fund is 22.9 million. Um, we have seen a estimated drawdown schedule from Rackland Partners, but obviously that's uh, an initial guesstimate. Um, we were a little concerned about designing investments around that. Uh, we certainly don't want you to be caught short if you need the money. Um, as far as the interest rates, most of these investments that are, and again, well, let me take a step back. The fiscal agent agreement that the trustee is operating under has a list of authorized investments. They are all very safe. Most of them are government securities. If they are certificates of deposit or other types of uh, non-government securities, the banks that are providing those have to be A rated or double A rated, depending on the type of rating. Um, so they're all very safe investments. And the bond insurer who's insuring the bonds actually gives us that section. So they, uh, they're the ones who'd be on the hook if something happened and they'd have to repay the bonds. So they have a very small list of investments that we can use. So they're all very safe. Uh, that being said, some have different interest rates. The, the determinant for the rates will be the ease at which you can pull them out. If it's, if it's more liquid, the rates will be lower. If it's, uh, if it's periodic uh, drawdown, then you get a little bit higher rate. And of course, the amount of time. We have uh, the district when they issued the bonds covenanted that you would spend most of the proceeds within three years. So we're really operating under a three-year window. That being said, we talked to the trustee. They have a investment department that will help you with this. And they've kind of come up with a plan. I gave them the preliminary drawdown schedule. And I also instructed them uh, just for informational purposes, assume that 20% of the proceeds are liquid at all times. Because we don't have a final drawdown schedule nailed down, I thought that might be a good place to start. That's just a suggestion up to you, uh, but it seemed to make sense. That's over $4 million that would be available at any, any minute. So I think that's a nice thing to have. And then we can talk about maybe scheduling out some of these investments. The trustee did come up with a plan and they have a suggested, uh, they, can, they can hone down the, the treasury security so that they uh, mature monthly. So you have a monthly drawdown uh, that's available. They also have short-term CD rates. Um, these are again from banks that are all AA rated or better. Uh, so they could do a CD laddered investment where they're maturing every month. So we can design something very specific. Uh, we can keep it general. Um, I think at this point we were suggesting, you know, keeping some amount liquid in the money market funds that the trustee already has these proceeds in. LAFE is, um, is good, but I think uh, I, I, I would suggest we authorize and, and maybe adopt the resolution that we presented tonight, but I'm not sure we'll end up using it, but I would like you to at least consider adopting it so that can be another option in your tool bag. That's kind of the general comments. I don't know where you want to go with this. I, again, I, I hesitate to give you something very specific because we don't have a specific drawdown schedule nailed down yet. Great. Thank you very much for, for that. Uh, Katie. Yeah. Um, so first of all, I'm really excited to see this information because even given the, you know, sort of schematic that you've presented here, we're looking at something north of a 500% improvement on return from what we thought about doing last month where we were gonna stick all the money in late. So that's great news. That's great news for taxpayers. I like that a lot. I guess my question is um, to what extent in your opinion is there a benefit in sticking things in life versus leaving it in, I mean, I know it's a like 0.003% difference in return versus just leaving it in a money market account, right? Like, does it make sense to keep some portion just liquid and in there? Is it worth going to the effort of putting things in life? I think it absolutely makes sense to put stuff in treasury. Um, but what's your what's your feeling on that? Yeah, the, the life is, uh, you know, you're dealing with the state and it is, it's a little difficult to deal with sometimes. Uh, they have their paperwork they want you to file. The trustee has to file some things with them. Uh, the trustee commented to me that it is in their hist history with LAIF, it is, they're kind of difficult to deal with. So that's a consideration. Um, 
However, the rates that they provide are starting to trend up. They, they weren't giving a very good rate in the last couple of months either, but mm -hmm. so I think their rates will go up. So I, I, again, I, I think it would be good to at least adopt this resolution to give you the option uh, if we want to in the future. I mean, a year from now, yeah. you may want to do it. Um, yeah. So I think that's one thing you could do constructively tonight, even if we don't decide down to the penny where you want this money to go, um, at least you'll have an extra option. Um, so that's that's kind of my comment on late. Yeah, yes, it's yeah. probably going to be, you know, some effort to put money with them, but you know they may as rates inch upward. You know, as we're all reading the headlines, uh, rates are going up pretty much every day. Uh, at yeah. some point, it may make sense to put some money with them. Yeah. Okay, I think that makes sense. And then just one quick follow up: Can you walk me through, please, what the sort of timeline would look like? I mean, sure, we can you know, in some sense, we can pass the resolution tonight. That's almost a separate issue. Um, would you talk me through what you would recommend in terms of like getting a drawdown schedule, making these allocations, how you would recommend that process proceeding? Yeah. So uh, when we did the bond issue, you adopted documents. One of them was that fiscal agent agreement. It mm -hmm. has the authorized investments already spelled out. It provides that the director, Nikki, can make these investments. Um, so you've already actually authorized all of this. I think, okay. um, you know, if you want to make a general direction to have her work with us and the trustee and, and come up with something, I think that would be good. I, I hate to keep coming back to you every time we have something, oh, this looks good or this looks better. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think we just need to pick something because we're losing out now every month right. not having this invested. So. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Well, and I will just say, I mean, before we kind of get into full board, I think the allocation that you guys have set out with, you know, basically a certain amount liquid kind of a on hand contingency. Um, and then the other allocations, those look good to me. I don't have any objection to any of that. So I think it looks great. Thank you. Colleagues, any other thoughts, comments, questions of Doug? Oh, okay. Um, just to make sure I'm clear, because unfortunately I was not uh, there for the last meeting. So the action is to adopt this resolution. Um, obviously, the sooner that we can decide the distribution of these bond proceeds, the better. Um, what? Well, like yeah. Said, we are missing out. So is it? Is it? We. Is it the, I mean, we could, if we wanted, I mean, but it's, you know, we could adopt this, the resolution, but we are still in a position where we are just having the money sitting, sitting there uh, where we could actually be, you know, making a better, better rate of return for the district. Um, and I, yeah, I, I think, think sooner the better. If, if you want to adopt the resolution again, as just to add an extra uh, piece in the toolkit, that's one step. And then right. I think that's step one. That's the, e I think, if anything, that's the easier part. But sure. the, the harder step is, you know, great, we got that. But now it's really, now where are we going to allocate? I mean, yeah, I like the idea of 20% aside, be liquid. Let's just say for, for argument's sake, 20% set aside to, for liquidity purposes, then we're looking at the 80%. And you could do a combination of treasuries and, and maybe a tiered CDs maturing on a monthly basis. Um, and, and you know, obviously, knowing that these are very uh, conservative investments, um, so it's just a matter of you know, picking which which makes sense. And this again, still not knowing exactly what what the construction schedule is going to be. Um, and Doug, maybe the core of the question is is that if we if, let's just for the fun of we decided today we're going to set twenty percent aside and forty percent in CDs, another forty percent in treasuries. By committing ourselves to that, at that tonight is an example. We could get, say, four months from now, five months from now, we actually finally have the the actual true cost estimates, and know kind of when we're going to start drawing down. Are we going to be in a position of where we we may have overcommitted ourselves to too long of a 
of an investment that we're we're having to borrow. It's you know it's really kind of look trying to look in a crystal ball, trying to understand maximize the, the rate of return without getting in ourselves a position where we have overcommitted our obligation for the investment, don't have enough liquidity to be able to cover our costs. So, you know maybe we should we should buffer. Maybe is that the twenty percent buffer that you're referring to that that, that gives us that latitude? So we don't have that yeah, issue. Yeah, and I think uh, I think it's a good amount. I mean, twenty percent of the project yeah, fund is four point six million. Um, we could increase that if it, if it makes you feel more comfortable. We could increase it to twenty five percent. But but I think right. it would be good to you know allow us the team to uh, to pick some maturities and just invest some of this extra money that uh, I can't imagine you would need all at once. No, we're not going to. Um, and at the, the the question is, is, you know, based on what we do know, do you have a set, are we going to work with the trustee to come up with a set of recommendations for us to break this down? Yes, and, and they have done that. They just sent it to me this afternoon, so I didn't have a chance to, to get it over to uh, Nikki, but um, I can share that with her tomorrow. We can, you know, if you want to give a general direction, if this schedule that we as an example, put in the staff report, if that looks reasonable, we can we can put together something like that. We can change the liquidity amount, if you like, if you're, if you're not happy with the 20%, we can bump that. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it's, you know, we, we need to get something invested in, in something. <laughs> so. No, clearly. And I guess yeah. the real question is, is that do we, as a, as a board, if we, we can, we can, set the set we can determine the set aside now we, we felt comfortable doing that whether that be 20 percent 30 percent and do we give and this is kind of a question for the group right now where nikki is like do we give her the authority based on the recommendations from uh, from you as well as the trustee to to proceed with this investment with some basic guardrails if you will as far as understanding the the, the the minimal amount of risk that the tr district is willing to take while at the same time maximizing our rate of return. So is that something that we can, is, is it the board's thoughts that we need to see the exact percentage breakdown and which investments? No. Uh, okay, I do have one, yeah. Sorry. Okay. Okay. As a point of order. Part? Yeah, okay. so as a point of order, as, as Doug says, like we've already authorized the director to do that right so we don't have to like there's no new action we need to take okay. um on that i think it's more a sense of you know some feedback and direction but there's no formal action in right. addition to the resolutions we've already passed that we would need to pass you know that and we would need to about, vote on right and what about the set aside this 20 so percent is it yeah so i don't know jason what you think but my my opinion is I think the 20% is reasonable. I might bump up the amount in LAIF to four or 4.5, given that it's an easier drawdown process. Um, but I think 20% is a super reasonable amount. Um, you know, we'll see what happens with the state library grant. That'll be, who knows, right? That, that's gonna impact the way a lot of this shakes out. Um, but I think, you know, I. If you wanted to put more somewhere, I would put more in life just because we can we can be a little more flexible how we draw down. We get a little bit extra return on it. Um, I don't think that we would need more than is already. And I mean, we're basically setting aside functionally for year one. Um, what is that? Four and a half and three and a half. Like that's a lot. That's nice. A lot of money. It's a ton yeah. of money. So and it's it's almost triple the Bob Lucas budget, which is our first project anyway. Not yeah. that we wouldn't be encouraged incurring costs right. at Maine, but I think it's fine. I think it's totally fine. And I also think that having some different vehicles gives us the flexibility to, you know, to make smart choices as we go. And so given that we've got some some reasonable recommendations, I feel totally comfortable um, encouraging Doug and Nikki to go ahead and move forward with an allocation that looks like this based on the best information that we have right now. The question was to you, Jason, I believe. I mean, I don't, <clears throat> I don't have a different opinion on any of it. I think, you know, to Katie's point, um, if, if I heard you right, Rushmore, like the one concern is if the timeline gets ahead of what we're committed to here, would we have the ability to access the appropriate funds. And I think to Katie's point, you know, we're, we're still targeting Bob Lucas first 
And I, you know, this current plan would give us more than enough to fully fund that project. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and it's just I appreciate that. And it's just making sure that at the same time we are conscious of the fact that we should try to maximize our rate of return at the same time. Sure. So try, trying to find that sweet spot, if you will, with some level of comfort. That's all. And if we have sufficiently provided or approved guidelines for the director to do so, and you know, setting aside twenty percent, I'm fine with that. And including this resolution that adds another. Uh, tool to the tool chest, that's fine as well. I mean, that's, I think that's what we're here to do tonight. So I, I, I think ultimately, I think we're, I think we're good to go. Uh, Terry, Camille, have any other thoughts on this? Well, I just think the time is the enemy right now. We really need to get stuff invested as soon as we can. So yep. the way I looked at tonight, I thought it was, a, this is the package we're going to deal with. And it looked pretty good to me. The, uh, I mean, because we got in the resolution it makes it very clear that Katie or that uh, Nikki's the one that makes the decisions about where and when to get the money and so on. Uh, I just think the, the, the other thing that bothers me a little bit is it'd be really nice to have a better estimate of what the drop down schedule is going to be that make you feel better in the long run. But in the short run, having 20 or 25, you know, percent of this in cash and the rest of it in some kind of an investment is the way to go. Mila, any thoughts? Um, before we move forward, can someone possibly summarize the resolution to me in layman's terms? This is, uh, it's authorizing an investment by the district with the state's local agency investment fund. The state of California, their treasury department runs this fund that any local entity can invest money in. Uh, to do so, to authorize you to be able to do that, they have this process and there's some paperwork. And so the first thing they want you to do is state your intention that you would like to invest with them. So that's really all this is at this point. It's not committing you to an amount. It's simply allowing a future investment. Okay, that's helpful. So it's it, in the, the action that we have is to approve this resolution to say, if we need to in the future, we can invest, the, the money can be invested in the local, the late. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Great, so with that being said, uh, may I get a motion to approve the resolution as it's presented in the board package? I move we approve the resolution in the board package. Thank you, Terry, may I get a second? I'll second. Great, thank you, Jason. Uh, any further discussions on the matter? Okay, seeing none, we'll take this matter to a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Sorry, I lost my mouse. Aye. <laughs> no worries. Thank you very much. And that's an I vote for me. Uh, that matter is approved. Thank you very much, Doug. Appreciate your presentation. Great. Okay, next uh, is what we're going to the new business. Uh, 8A, review and approval of the new uh, Altadena Library District unfunded accrued liability policy, which is in, starting on page 98 of the board package. All right, good evening again. Um, so we, we do have Andrew Flynn from CalMuni here to talk us through the unfunded accrued liability policy. Um, as my report states, CalMuni reached out to us to provide a presentation back, I, I think in December, Ian Berg and I from IBLE um, attended it, agreed that it was good to move forward. The board authorized us to set up the policy um, with help from CalMuni. We brought this to the budget committee and there, there were several really good questions. So I tried to inform the staff report for some of the things that came up. So um, to provide a little bit more clarity, but again, Andrew's here to walk us through, answer any questions you might have. And budget committee members are here as well if they have anything to add. Andrew, do you want to just provide maybe like a really quick summary as to why we're doing this, I guess? Uh, of course, of course. Good, good evening, trustees. Thank you for the opportunity. So again, my name is Andrew Flynn. I'm with California Municipal Advisors. Obviously, you're, you're talking uh, to municipal advisors on a variety of fronts this evening. Um, so this evening, really what I'm here to do is to talk to you about the, uh, the unfunded actuarial liability policy that's in front of you this evening. The goal of the policy is to build a long-term plan in order to manage the unfunded liabilities associated with your pensions, 
um, out into the future. So the, the way to think about your unfunded liabilities is that when, uh, when you are working with CalPERS uh, to manage your pension policies, um, they have a long-term target in order in, in terms of how much they anticipate that the district is ultimately obligated to pay to their ben your beneficiaries, your employees. So they build these plans out over a long period of time. Obviously, they have lots of complex calculations that go into determining the, uh, the accrued benefits that are uh, accrued to your employees. Um, and they also calculate over time how much money you have with CalPERS currently to fulfill those obligations. These numbers fluctuate over time. The easiest way to think about this is, um, let's just say 30 years ago, when you were your employees were accruing benefits, uh, they were anticipated to live to be 78 years old. And now, for example, people, they say, are going to live to be on average 83 years old. Well, by the very nature of people living lo a longer period of time, the unfunded liabilities are created because, again, you hadn't set aside monies to anticipate those people living that long term. Right. So it's these types of variables that will evolve over time that are that create unfunded liability. Uh, what I will tell you is that a lot of the unfunded liability that the district has was ultimately created back during the financial crisis, back in 08, 09, and it has evolved over time. So right now, your funded percent overall for all of your, your three pension plans is about 70%. And what we're trying to do is get you guys up into the 90 to 95% and keep you there. The reason we want to do that is because your unfunded liabilities are very expensive, okay? So when CalPERS calculates how much um, you know, your pension plans should grow uh, in order to fulfill your obligations, they grow at what they call the discount rate. Now, the discount rate is basically that assumed growth rate of these plans over time. And right now it's at 6.8%. So in so much as you have unfunded liabilities with CalPERS, you're responsible for making up that 6.8% growth each year. So think of it as debt that's growing at 6.8% each year. Now, you, again, you guys just issued debt, so you know 6.8% is very expensive. So you And you can't necessarily make unfunded liability go away, but what you can do is proactively manage it over the long term. So this policy that's in front of you isn't intended to make it go away. It's intended to mitigate it over time and minimize those costs to the district in order to A, keep your, your plans healthy, make sure that you're fulfilling your obligations to your employees, but B, manage the costs long-term because again, not only is it a very expensive debt, but the way these liabilities are structured over time by CalPERS, they can become very budgetarily challenging. Uh, right now, you have they, they, they're basically what I would define as a dome shape, right? Your payment structures are increasing over time and they will decrease out 10, 15, 20 years. What we want to do is we want to start to level those structures out so that budgetarily you have more consistency going forward each year. So this policy really isn't just about you know, current staff and current board. It's also future staff and future board. So the actions that are baked into the policy are really intended to be considered each year, right? This is about, this is about staff bringing forward recommendations to the board of trustees each year to incrementally manage these liabilities. You wanna work yourself up to that 90 to 95%. And then the goal is how do you keep yourself there, right? And so a lot of the actions are about making additional discretionary payments, you know, each year. So a lot of these moves are really small. It's, it's questions of, do we have excess reserves? Um, and if we have excess reserves, which again, might be sitting in LAFE or something similar where interest rates are very low, is there an opportunity to, instead of sitting on excess reserves, making additional discretionary payments? Again, to lower your overall cost, uh, but also to create more level structures going forward so that your, your payment structures are more consistent going out into the future. So that's a, that's a very high level overview. There's lots of, of different uh, strategies that are laid out in the presentation uh, or out in the policy, I apologize, um, yeah, that, that we could go into. Uh, but that is really the kind of the core goal of the overarching policy is really, like I said, to get you guys on a long-term trajectory of managing these liabilities um, so that, again, it's not, it, it's not catching someone out into the future. It's about kind of long-term long good governance around managing these liabilities. So thank you for that summary, Andrew. That was very clear. Uh, colleagues, questions or comments? 
Uh, I have just one quick question. Um, Andrew, thanks for that. That makes a lot of sense. And I watched your presentation at the uh, budget committee meeting too. So I'm starting to piece it all together. It's a very complex issue to me. I'm sure it is to all of us a little bit. I, first of all, I wanted to start with what, what is CalMuni? I, I, I'm not quite sure. Do you, do you advise us for a fee or how does that all work? Uh, yeah, so actually, uh, much like the last presentation, uh, California Municipal Advisors is a general municipal advisory firm. So we advise on a whole variety of topics. Um, we we work on debt issuances for, for certain agencies. We work on, on, on various topics. For you guys, we were engaged specifically to work on, on your pension policy. Uh, we work with a lot of agencies around California specifically on this topic. Um, you know, really to help agencies understand kind of how do you build a discipline around managing these liabilities on a go forward basis. So yeah, okay. we were specifically engaged for this process. Okay. And in a real basic rudimentary way, this is a little bit like paying extra on your principal and your mortgage payment, to a, but you've got different tools, different ways to do that for us going forward, right? That's exactly it. Yes. I, I honestly, that, that's exactly how I explain it to people is really when it boils down to it, this is a time value of money exercise. Yeah, if you pay a little more principal today, um, you're gonna pay less long-term. And so it's really just about the mechanics. And again, in a, in a public agency setting, what are the things that you should, what are the questions you should ask? What are the approaches you might take in any given year, given where you're at in your overall fiscal situation? Great, thank you. Great, anyone else? I just want to say thanks, Terry. That was a helpful reframe for even my brain to think about uh, think about it in that way in terms of paying extra on the mortgage. Yeah. Yeah, this becomes a real big issue for a lot of public municipalities across the country. Uh, unfunded liabilities can really get out of hand, and it's I'm happy that we were going to have a policy in place that truly addresses this. And you know, we're pretty fortunate that this is not out of control, but they certainly have. This principal policy in place as a guiding principle on a going to go for a basis is, is you know very prudent. So I appreciate the uh, the policy as it's written. So uh, with that, uh, if there's no further discussions, may I get a motion to approve this uh, unfunded accrued liability policy? So moved. Great. Thank you. May I get a second? I second. Great, thank you very much, Terry. And we'll take this matter to a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. Great, and that's an aye vote for me. The uh, policy is now approved. Andrew, thank you very much once again for being here this evening, uh, describing that uh, what could be rather complex into you know, very basic uh, concepts. So very much appreciate your work tonight. Thank, thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Andrew. All right, great. great. Now, next on our agenda is 8B, review and approval of the proposed salary schedule for the forthcoming 22-23 fiscal year. This starts on page 109 of your budget package. Nikki? All right. Hello again. Um, so each year as we approach the proposed budget, we look at a cost of living increase. Um, Oftentimes we've looked, and I, I look back historically, it typically falls somewhere in the range of where LA County's um, CIP, so consumer index product um, is at. I've, I, in the past five years, I've seen anywhere from probably like two to 5%, depending on like where LA County was at. So two years ago, we did the classification of compensation study. We got everybody into the correct and recommended salary schedule for, um, where, where they fell in with market. And then last year we brought forth a 2%, again, being very conservative, not sure if we were still gonna have, see any impacts on the budget um, because of the pandemic and who knew what was gonna happen. So as I know, all of you are very aware, um, inflation has gone through the roof and especially LA County, but all over the country and the world. Um, the CPI rose 8.5% in the last 12 months in LA County. So I, in conversations as we were developing the proposed budget and looking at the salary schedule and how that would impact the budget with Ian Berg, as well as Christy even, who's here from IBLE tonight, he proposed that we look at a higher um, COLA, which is what a lot of agencies that he's worked with are doing this year um, to try to level things out because 
as you know, cost of, in, cost of living has gone up and to stay competitive with salaries and everything else, uh, we, we've brought forth to the budget committee a 5% COLA as the recommendation. Um, budget committee had discussion and support, asked questions around how much it would cost to look at potentially a 6% or 7% increase to get it closer to the 8.5%. Um, and what we looked at was about $30,000 per increase percentage and ultimately voted um, at the budget committee meeting for and, and directed staff to bring forth a 7% increase. Uh, so as you can see from my report, a 7% COLA uh, would have a $199,600 increase to the overall proposed budget for fiscal year 22-23. When we originally brought it to the budget committee, it was, I think, closer to 150,000. Um, so yeah, that's where we're at. And as you'll see, when we go into the next budget item, which is the proposed budget, it took us from putting $10,000 in reserves to approximately pulling $19,000. Although we have an update to that as well, which is actually, we're not gonna be drawing down from reserves at all. But I wanted to allow for questions and the budget committee members that are here tonight um, to discuss further. So that's kind of where we're at. Great, thank you, Nikki. Mm -hmm. Thoughts, comments, colleagues? So if, if I may, just a couple of um, observations and, you know, we've outlined this in the budget committee report as well. So obviously a 7% increase can, can seem like a lot. And it's certainly a substantial jump from where we've been in the past. That being said, you know, I think it's worth noting that staff are the ones that are going to bear the burden of inflation. And one of the things that we face as a smaller district is difficulty in remaining competitive with larger organizations. So I think that it's really important um, that when we're able to, and, you know, when it doesn't present an undue financial hardship, that we do everything we can to keep our salaries competitive. And so, you know, for all of those reasons, I think that it makes sense this year, given these particular circumstances, to look at a more aggressive cost of living adjustment than we have perhaps in previous years. Thank you, Katie. Any other thoughts, comments, colleagues? I was just uh, going to ask the committee members or Nikki if if we've looked at um, any options around expanding uh, the healthcare coverage that we provide, because I think you know it's one thing when we're looking at LA County to look at salaries, but you know LA County also provides fully paid family healthcare, and so right off the bat, we're you know probably twelve, thirteen hundred dollars plus a month behind in compensation to the county before you even get into the salaries question. That's a really good point. Yeah, just something I mean, that yeah that I think um, I've had conversations with Ian and Christy about, and I think we need to do more research around like what that would look like. Is it a, a stipend for individual versus couple versus family? Because like, agreed, um, I know the board is aware from conversation that like it's been it's been hard to recruit at times. And a part of that is the health benefits. You know, we cover six hundred dollars a month, but if you're coming in with a family rate, right, that's, it's a substantial bump, especially someone coming from LA County to your point, Jason. Um, what we did build into this year's salary increase is a wellness stipend. That's a one, one time a year, $400 wellness stipend that theoretically would cover a person's gym membership, let's say. We also built in bilingual pay as um, something that will go into effect in um, the next fiscal year. I just like, we're going to need to do more research and I wasn't ready to increase what we're going to give for health benefits until we did, you know, again, knew what that was going to look like, ran that through the budget committee. And I, I do think starting in July, that's something we're going to have to look at as well as maybe even looking at the salary schedule in terms of growing it in terms of steps. Cause you know, we only have six steps and that can be tough if you have to bring someone in at a higher step as well. So all of those things are definitely something I, I want to spend more time and bring to the budget committee as well as the full board to inform how that's going to impact the budget. 
but yes, the answer is yes. And then, you know, I would just say in general, um, you know, the, the county announced they're, they're giving a five and a half percent wage increase and a, I think $1,350 bonus in addition to increases to healthcare and stuff like that. So I, like, I personally think that a 7% raise is probably barely keeping us wherever we are is where we fit in the market. Um, you know, I, I get it. Like we're, we're much smaller. Our budget's much smaller. We probably will never be able to match some of these larger agencies, but at the same time, I think our community, like we need to be competitive enough to bring in good, dedicated, experienced people because our community deserves more than should just be a training ground for inexperienced folks to just go and move on, right? Like I think Altadena deserves better than that. I think Altadena expects better than that. And it's just the reality that we're going to have to try and figure out. And if we can be competitive, continue to do that without sacrificing programs and services, which is what I'm hearing, we're, we're able to do both. I fully support that. Well, and if I could just respond to that briefly, I, I also think that there is, you know, a, a convincing argument to be made to see how inflation, you know, kind of behaves next year, right? So I think that it, it would be great if we could, you know, get to our 8% or 9% or something like that. But, you know, if things continue unchecked, um, and inflation is high next year, We, I think we wanna keep the ability to to try and stay up with that to your point so that, you know, we're never gonna be LA County and we're never gonna be New York City, but, you know, we also have a situation where our tax base is homes and homes in Altadena are doing great. Like the, the asset value of homes is going up, 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 up. And so I think that we're obligated to pass some of that on to the people who work for the district. Okay, thank you. A um, couple of thoughts. Um, first, yes, we need to stay competitive with other libraries. And I know that our health compensation is, health insurance compensation is not where it should be. Um, I definitely want to see our employees compensated and compensated well to not only retain but to attract i would prefer to do that though with an analysis of how we stack up against other libraries so that we can make a conscious decision about where we want it to fit relative to the county library system of county of los angeles or city of los angeles or city of pasadena and do a side-by-side -side comparison and and then come up with a, you know, an adjustment to the wages as well as the overall compensation package, which should include health insurance or anything else, but done so in a manner that is actually done in a comprehensive fashion. Picking a, a moment in time of CPI, it's, it's, I think it's an outlier. Um, you could see the, the, the pendulum swing the other way. Next year, you could have a 1% or even in a couple of years, you have a negative uh, CPI. So typically what you see in when you're tying CPI, you usually have a range and you may have like a cap, like 5% or, or in a, a, a low end of 2%. So it'd be able to compensate for employees even when the CPI could be uh, half a percent as an example and still give them 2%, 3% raise so that you have the ability to control the costs and you have parameters and guardrails around this, the pendulum swings of the CPI. And I, I'm not certain, I, I fully support the original report that was prepared for 5%, or I'd even go 5.5%, but it seems to be this is somewhat of a, an opp opportunistic way to compensate the employees. And I, I know the employees are watching this, it's not anti employee and I don't want to pay you more money. It's more, I just think from a fundamental standpoint, I think that we need to really have parameters around the, the range of compensation and, you know, 2%, 5%. And then if their CPI is higher, we roll it over. It's like, you can even have those provisions. And then on top of that, let's focus on the health benefits. So it's that we are providing not only a, a, a good, reasonable 
salary this competitive that after an analysis if we need to adjust that's fine but to tie it just to the cpi i think it's can we cover it yes but i think it's somewhat present setting because the next year we could have a negative a negative uh, cpi or, or half percent and then what are we going to do give half percent and i think there's going to be you know calls for a raise there as well so i just think that whereas i'm, I'm very much supportive of a raise and supportive of five percent five and a percent but just just to tie it to the CPI here a moment in time at 7% and not look at it from a holistic standpoint as far as the overall compensation package of the employees, I, I can't necessarily get my head around. So if I could respond to that, I think, you know, that we've done that kind of comprehensive work in terms of the classification compensation study that we did several years ago. Um, and I don't, I, you know, I don't know that it makes sense to sort of redo that at this point in time when the only takeaway is that the cost of living is going up dramatically and wages are rising at other institutions. I mean, the real question in, in that investigation was, you know, to what extent are our sort of internal alignments making sense? And the outcome of that survey was that we're not terribly competitive with a lot of larger libraries. So I, I think we do have that data, right? I, and I think that what that data told us is that we're on the lower end of what libraries pay people. And I don't think it's reasonable to imagine that, you know, we're going to transform that reality. But I do think that staff are bearing the costs of a, a heightened, you know, inflationary environment of a higher cost of living in Los Angeles County. And I don't, you know, I don't think that it's fair to say to them, well, you know, you got to wait until we come up with a variety of policies. Well, it still costs way more to fill up your car. Your rent costs more. Everything costs more. So I, you know, I, I think that cost of living adjustments have traditionally always been related to the way that the CPI behaves. I think that that's a reasonable metric to use. If in future, you know, you think that it is reasonable to have some sorts of limits around cost of living adjustments. I think that's a separate policy question that we could address, um, but I would really advocate for, you know, a robust response to the economic conditions that folks are in. Okay, fair enough, okay. Uh, any other comments from uh, our colleagues? Yeah, I'm Great. Going. Um I kind of, when you see the number, the, the 7%, it's, it's so much bigger than what we do in the past that you have to kind of wrap your head around it a little bit. And I did see the model that was presented for the 5% um, at, the, at the budget meeting itself. I kind of agree with you, Rushmore, about you know looking at an 8% inflation rate. It, it might not be that, that much longer or it might taper down to have an average rate over the year be something less than that. I've seen some models that actually predict that and maybe even less the year after that. But you can't really go forward with that kind of data because nothing, you know, it doesn't exist yet. So I'm, I'm kind of getting back toward 7%, even though it's a, a sobering number, we, we definitely can't afford it. And the other thing is that I think Katie mentioned about housing costs and our tax base is going to go up. And I think it's got to go up more than we think it'll go up this next year based on what's happening in the market and so on. So there's really not an issue with us affording this. One thing I wouldn't want it to do would be in any way seem as if it's being pulled out of funds that we're trying to keep separate for the building project that we have and so on. But we can do this with the revenue that we're getting out on certain of it. The, the other part, the gloom and doom part about, well, gee, Right. Actually, the good news would be if, if uh, inflation starts to taper off, starts to go down, and by the end of the year, we're at a 6% rate or something like that, and next year, it even gets lower than that, the, um, we would have given our employees a 7% raise with no, you know, that, that would have to do probably for a raise maybe two years in a row. And I, I think that might have been what you were alluding to, Katie. So, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff wrapped up in this, but I'm 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 a little warmer to the idea that seven percent is a good number, especially given the job market, and um, it's not going to break the bank with us. And I think it can be kept away from any money that we're getting for the the renovation that we plan to do. So I, I can support this one. 
Okay, appreciate that. And Katie, to your point about the analysis that's been done, I know that's been done. There was some adjustments made two years ago based on the report. I, what's before us, though, was based off, off the CPI. So that I'm only responding to that, not what not what happened two years ago. So, that, so that's all I can base my opinion on is what I'm sure. seeing is tied to CPI, and I, and I don't. And I personally think we should have some sort of parameters, but uh, there, 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 there is a motion on, uh, well, we, I need a motion for the uh, the matter before us, if anyone wants to move. I have a question. Yes. Sorry. Hey. Um, no, it's good. Um, <clears throat> I wanted to understand also, because I, I, what I think I heard you, Rushmore, and, and Terry say um, is about like what happens next year if again it goes you know back down to like you were saying a half a percent or whatnot we are not at all required to stay where you know like it's not going to automatically be like well it's seven percent again it's it we could at that time you know there may be other factors involved in you know what the the cola adjustment looks like but i wanted to and I think that we discussed that in the budget meeting that that we were in yeah. no way required to stay there if things shift in the next years to come. And I, I just wanted to be clear on that. That's correct. This doesn't yeah. tie you in. Right. But, 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 but what you're what you're looking at is uh, is a seven percent raise based on a CPI for a set of twelve months. Um, and that's the basis for it. So the subsequent year, we're having this discussion again, and the CPI is half percent, then what are the parameters going to be around a, a, a COLA at that point? And all I'm suggesting is that there be some level of consistency as how we approach that, you know, in having guardrails as far as, which is fiscally responsible and um, prudent to be able to, you know, if the CPI is half percent, we can still offer three or 4% based on a variety of factors. That, and it's not against anti-raises, it's not anti, right. you know, giving the employees a competitive salary. It's, I, I just don't agree with tying it solely to the CPI when it's super high, because we're certainly not going to give them a you know, half percent raise if it's, you know, if, if the CPI is that low next year, say, well, the CPI is this, then we're going to come up with some other reason. I'm just saying there should be, for transparency purposes, a clear set of parameters as to how we evaluate what the, what the salaries of the employees are. Right. And I think that's a good point. And so then my question was from all of that was going to be, um, I don't recall having this, con you know, we may have had it, you know, last year and I don't recall, but is there any type of like, you know, guardrails or guidelines in, or in determining um, how these things are adjusted or how was it done? I'm just curious if it was done this way in the past as well, because then it would seem like it would be consistent with history, basically. Yeah, so as we do budget prep every year, we, we predict out what we think, like if people are getting raises and every everything that goes into paying the staff, including health benefits and whatnot, and then we build in what the COLA would look like and what we can afford is basically what it's come down to because we, you know, as you know, we try to have as close to a zero net balance at the end of the year as we possibly can. So last year, the 2%, which was what we were able to afford to pay. Um, and again, that was with very conservative numbers in projecting the budget this year because we weren't sure if there was going to be an impact. But again, that at, it goes in, in accordance with making sure you can afford to pay the staff the COLA that you're presenting. That's, you know, it's, it's part of the package. And every year we bring it forward to the board to vote on as part of the proposal process, so. Well, it sounds like it's, cons even though this conversation, you know, took a, a little bit of a turn in terms of the, the cost of living um, index, but it sounds like it's still consistent with practice in terms of how this has been done in the past. Yeah, like I think before I came, the year or two before, it, there was like a 3.6% COLA. And then like when we did this, the class and comp study, that bumped specific people up quite a bit. So we just built, got everybody into the right range, which was a fiscal impact, but there, 
nobody made less. Um, some, it was a, it, it was incremental, but again, that was right at the beginning of the pandemic too. And we weren't sure what was going to happen with the budget as well, but at least we got everybody on pay being paid on market based on that class and comp study. So every year it's been different, you know, and I think we have to assess based on what we're projecting to bring in and what we can afford to pay as well as those other things that we talked about. I'd like to explore more of the like health benefits and other, um, compensation that we can use to recruit and maintain uh, high quality staff as well. Okay. So I think that, um, I think that the points you make are, are really valid ones, Rushmore. And I, I wonder if it's not kind of a both and rather than an either or. So I, I think that it makes sense to look at the ways that we assess and evaluate salaries. I think it makes sense to say, here are the kind of data points we're going to consider. Here are the kind of metrics we're going to use. I think that all makes a lot of sense. And I think we should definitely do that. Um, I, you know, I don't, I don't, I wouldn't advocate, you know, not taking a, a equivalent step um, tonight in, you know, in light of that work being done, because it'll take some time to do. But I, I think it's reasonable to say, okay, let's, you know, make whatever decision we're going to make on a cost of living adjustment tonight. And also, let's undertake that process so that we do have a little bit more consistently spelled out set of, of norms and practices. Because I don't disagree with you. I mean, I think that there are other data points as well, because you know there may be other things that impact folks that are not reflected in the consumer price index, right? And I, I think we want to take those into account. Um, but I, I do know for sure that staff have already been bearing the costs of a higher inflationary environment for as long as that has persisted. And no matter where inflation shakes out at the end of the year, that's a cost they've already incurred. Yeah, I, I and I appreciate that. And it's 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 coming from a perspective of wanting to pay compensate our employees properly with the the right health insurance that makes us competitive. As I was saying, mm -hmm. this is just a, just this is just a, a reaction to a CPI number. And so I, if we, I, I think that we should look at the overall compensation package. And I know that the study was done two years ago, but maybe we're 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 off again as far as not keeping pace with the libraries and the surrounding areas. I, I don't really know. I, I mean, if the study was done two years, I haven't looked at that. So I don't know if it's, to me, it's, it's just, you know, just words. I, I need to see something in writing be able to, to support that. So I think that if, at the very least, we need to, on a, on a go forward basis, have some, have some discussions about, about how we're going to, you know, provide cost of living increases but over, but it's it's the compensation package not just cola the, the, the cola is just a percentage but we, we really need to look at the comprehensive compensation structure to again to retain and attract employees um so it so in in not just the way we're doing it tonight so yeah, what's been i don't disagree with that so, so I, and i um, also think we can agendize that for the next I, I would like to have, i think it's a good idea yeah, so I would like to have that as far as the uh, an agenda. So for uh, for the the committee to report on, just coming up with some. I'm not sure it requires getting another analysis, but first there's just like a policy. So what are we gonna? What are the factors we're gonna look at, and and then how how frequently you're gonna do analysis of other other library districts, and, and what 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 are the factors utilized to develop. Uh, a compensation package that makes us competitive that helps Nikki not have to interview every you know every other every right. other week you know fortunately right. she's not doing it right now so it's so <laughs> it's staying competitive you know yeah. that's what it's I don't, that's, I don't that's, that's, that's where I'm coming from I think that's I, reasonable I agree and I think that it's also possible even if you don't do another analysis I think what part of what you're saying Rushmore is to at least you know look at the analysis that's been done and utilize that as a factor as the decisions are being made. Um, and right. if perhaps the analysis is more than five years old or something like that, then, you know, maybe looking at uh, redoing that. But if you have good recent data, I think it's it's a it's a good idea to have a set of factors in which you use to make these decisions. Right. No, and I appreciate that. And that's, that's still to be the goal. So we could have the budget 
committee work on that and, and set some sort of policy yeah. or parameters that the, the, the board could utilize on a go-forward basis to look at the compensation package, which does include salary, which does include insurance and other things that make us, you know, the, the, the wellness program, all of these things that, mm-hmm. that make the district. And, and you know, the thing is, you got you to gotta think about this as well, is, is that we were just had a discussion about the unfunded, unfunded liability. Uh, pension liability. Well, if you increase, you know, even two percent from five percent to seven percent, that's you're you're also then increasing the, the pension obligation there as well. I mean, just just be mindful that it's not just the salary moment in time, but exponentially, this is your pension is going to be going up as well. So, it you've got to think of it from that perspective, and then the, the pendulum swing. So even though we may you know could ultimately give them a one percent raise the next year, you're still, you've already compensated that seven percent, and we're going to continue to pay on that pension thereafter. So. Just something to consider. So anyway, uh, so the, the budget committee can work on that and come back with some primers. That'd be great. Yeah, Thank you absolutely. For Thank you absolutely. for indulging me. Um, so we have this matter. Do I have a motion uh, to approve uh, items 8B as agendized? So I'll move that we approve a 7% cost of living increase for the salary schedule for fiscal year 22-23. Can I get a second? I will second. Okay, thank you. All right. Any further discussions on this matter? Okay. Great. Seeing none, we'll take it to a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. Great. And uh, this is a no vote for me, and only because of the way it's presented in the, in the report, but you understand where I'm coming from. Does, again, support the, the staff, but based on based on how it's presented it's a no for, no vote for me the items approved thank you very much uh so next item on the agenda is uh, eight, yes can we take like a three minute break <laughs> um yes well yeah thank you for jeff yeah, we jeff, yeah, to <laughs> before we start the budget yeah so 708 i mean these are, the next things are very light so no, so, uh how about say we'll yeah. um want to do 10 minutes no five no It'd be like <laughs> I'm good with five. But five? Okay. All right. Let's go. It's uh, it's seven oh eight. We'll reconvene at uh, at seven fifteen. Okay. Thanks.
Jason, had any good rides lately? Yeah, I did. Um, yesterday, I, I rode up to Crystal Lake. Oh, I love that ride. You so, start over at, at the park in Canto? Mm-hmm. It was kind of perfect weather. I mean, it was warm, but on the way down, I actually had put a vest on. You Up there, you can catch the cooler breezes. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, it's, uh, you're, you're talking a couple, uh, quite a few degree difference from, from the top to the bottom. Yep. yep. Oh, I love that ride. <laughs> Is this a bike ride or a motorcycle ride? Bicycle <laughs> ride. Bike. Oh, it's a lot of fun. You just put your head down and grind. <laughs> hmm. If anybody's never been up there, it's kind of like a secret little place. Like there's cabins you can rent. There's a campground. Up at the top of the 39 or up yeah. at the top of Azusa? Yep. Yeah. Yep. You keep going. Yep. Right before you hit uh, Angeles Crest Highway, you know, there's a, you turn off, there's, there's Crystal Lake. It's really pretty up yeah. there. So a lot, it's a, a lot of bicyclists go up there. Actually, motorcycles go up there too, but mm -hmm. we were talking about bike riding up there. I've done it a few times. It's, it's a challenging ride, but it's, it's definitely fun, worthwhile. Okay. Um, Nikki, we should, uh, we are at 7.15, so we should uh, start taping again, please. Or did we ever, did we stop? I guess we never stopped, did we? Yeah, I know. Okay, all right, so, all right, well, we are back in session. So we are now on to agenda item uh, 8C, review and approval of the proposed budget for the forthcoming 22-23 fiscal year, which is uh, starts on page 111 of your package. I'm happy to hand it over to Anna, hooray. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, so today we'll be going through the 2022-2023 proposed budget. This was a collaborative effort. Uh, we had input from Ida Bailey, specifically Ian Berg and Christy Even. Um, and uh, so once consulting with them, we also uh, met with our department heads uh, to go over um, their request for programming and other operational needs. Um, and the outcome is what we'll be going through today. What makes this budget unique is its breakdown. Uh, previously, we saw sort of this consolidated version that combined um, the various sources of funding. So what we did this year was sort of make it a little bit more transparent in terms of what we're using different funding types for. Um, so as a result, we have um, the following four different breakdowns. Uh, they are the general funds, donations and grants, capital projects, and CFD bond issuance. So as we kind of go through, I'll be revisiting just these types of definitions, just to kind of bear them in mind as we start uh, discussing income and expenses. If any questions come up uh, as we start, you know, as I present, just feel free to interrupt and just let me know when you know, we could sort of stop there and address it then. So uh, leading with, uh, general funds. These are funds allocated from the County of Los Angeles and also earned uh, via library operations. Um, and so in looking at, uh, please reference page 116 in your packets. Um, looking at line two, we have property tax and assessments. We see an expected 2% increase um, over projected year end. Um, fines and fees, this is primarily our passport revenue and You'll see it's a little bit of a decrease, um, but pretty comparable um, to last year's budgeted um, revenue. Um, interest income, um, just like property tax, it, we saw a 2% increase. We also see a 2% increase. Um, this income is primarily sourced through the County of Los Angeles. So that's why you'll see um, how, how they relate. Um, on line five, we have other revenues. This is primarily sourced from our E-rate. Uh, this is our broadband uh, rebate funds that are typically received around October. Um, in terms of salary on line 12, we see an 8% overall increase. Um, this does incorporate the proposed COLA of 7%, um, the wellness stipend, um, and the addition of two part-time library clerks. Um, and before we move on to fringes, I did want to highlight, uh, Nikki um, hinted to it a little earlier, we were in receipt of some really great news. Um, on line 19, workers' compensation um, insurance, that actually went down uh, 25000 this year. 
Um, so we received this number um, a little bit too late to adjust uh, the package, awesome. but yeah. Oh my gosh, um, that's great. Yeah, and I'd really like you all to keep that number in mind because once we get down to um, the, just as stated, um, right now it's showing, it's reflecting a drawdown for our general funds, just sort of keep this $25,000 savings in mind because it does significantly impact um, projected year end. Um, so really great thing to celebrate, um, something we received this week. So we're, we're really excited about that. Um, so previous to this news on line 23, we were projecting a 10% increase. Um, again, this, is, this number is significantly impacted by that $25,000 savings. Um, in terms of operating expenses on line 37, um, we see an increase. Um, on line 36, you'll notice the trustee election. Um, so that's that's primarily where you'll see that 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 wasn't um, a prior year cost. So that's why you see the numbers blank and you see this increase here. Um, we are proposing to purchase our Xerox printers um, as approved. So this results on line 29 you'll see a $30,000 savings in column C. On line 32, you'll notice a new line. Uh, this is our mobile library. We thought it more transparent to add to this line. What this is, is the purchase of this new van will require us to add shelving and then also, you know, the oil changes, gas. We didn't think it'd be fair to combine that cost with programming. So we went ahead and isolated that cost so that way everybody could see um, the proposed maintenance. For the following, um, jumping two years ahead, you won't see um, you'll see you won't see that fifteen thousand dollar setup fee. Um, so really, typically, it would cost us forty three hundred dollars in van maintenance every year. But because we're buying a new one, it requires a little bit more of a setup for this one time. Sorry, Anna, real quick: forty three hundred dollars per van, or forty three hundred dollars for both vans? For both vans, projected for both. Okay. Yes. okay. Um, moving on to page 117, we have professional services. Uh, we see line 39 is, de line 39 is decreasing um, down to 60,000, um, primarily due to uh, bringing our financial function in-house. Uh, I'd Bailey will now transition into an advisory role. role. So um, this will result in a significant savings for the upcoming fiscal year. Also on line 49, summing up our information and technology um, expense grouping. On line 45, uh, you'll see a decrease there, primarily because there's no need uh, for laptops. Uh, last year, we had a big um, sort of new purchasing of new laptops available to the public. They won't, they won't be necessary this year, given that they're expected to function properly in this upcoming fiscal year. Um, we also see an increase in line 46. Um, it's about $8,000. This is our printer, printer maintenance agreement. Um, along with purchasing the Xerox maintenance, uh, we will um, uh, be retaining Xerox for uh, repairs and maintenance uh, throughout the year. So that's why you see an increase there. Um, library materials on line 59, you'll see that they're close to last year. There's nothing too significant to report here. Um, programming, we see a small decrease in this is in this figure, and that's on line 67. Um, that doesn't mean that there's going to be a decrease in spending. It's just that we increased um, donations and grants uh, to contribute towards our programming. So we have additional funding available that won't be coming from our general funds. So uh, down to line 117. Um, um, uh, excuse me, page 117, line 74. Um, we see that we were originally positioned for a $19,000 drawdown for this fiscal year, but given that we have a $25,000 savings in workers' compensation with um, the projected 8% COLA, we'd be close to breaking even. We'd have about $5,000 in reserves. Um, so really great news to celebrate there. Um, I'm happy to pause here to see if anybody has any questions on the... Um, on the general funds budget as projected. Colleagues, any questions so far? Okay. No, I think we're good. You did a great job, Anna. Keep going. Thank you. Uh, moving on to page 118, we have donations and grants. These are funds received uh, via confirmed donations and grants awarded. 
Um, this does not account for any sort of grant that let's say we've applied for and haven't received. These are, these are confirmed uh, funding types. And so leading with line three, we have the Altadena Library Foundation. Um, they have confirmed uh, their donation amount for this fiscal year. We see an increased amount due to uh, community outreach as we approach renovations. Um, on line four, we have Friends of the Library. Um, again, we also see an increased donation amount as COVID restrictions uh, impact the community less um, and the book sale activity they're anticipated to profit on. On line five, we have the California Library Literacy Services. Uh, we received an email from them um, and they confirmed um, the 24 grand um, as listed on the budget. Um, the Emergency Connectivity Fund, uh, this decreased amount is just reflecting um, that we are not anticipating uh, buying new laptops. That's why that amount was um, a little bit more aggressive uh, this fiscal year. Um, so really we're only anticipating um, new 16 new hotspots, hot I believe. Um, and so that, that should um, only cover that amount. Um, and on line seven, we have the Ca uh, California Library expanding our footprint. Uh, these funds were awarded um, in 2021-2022, um, but we're carrying these funds over into this, this fiscal year because uh, it was received at the tail end. Um, in terms of wages, the amount allocated towards wages is the efforts uh, behind the literacy program, and that's reflected on line 13. Operating expense expenses on line 18. Um, those cover uh, the vending machine purchases. We're anticipating uh, purchasing two vending machines and its related maintenance. Totals to be $162,500. Um, we also have staff recognition within that grouping um, funded by the Friends of the Library. On uh, line 28, uh, we're reflecting our programming. We see an overall increase of $10,000 in these expenses compared to this current fiscal year. Um, this is related to the adult services and the all ages programming. Um, the adult services program covers our second Saturday. We're seeing an increased cost in entertainment. Um, so that's why we, we decided to put more money away in that for that cost. Um, information technology um, summed up on line 38. These costs are covered by expanding our footprint and the emergency connectivity fund. Um, moving on to page 119, this is our capital projects fund. This includes uh, the carryover funds of the bond proceeds received this fiscal year um, and the use of these funds for the renovation. So as you see on line two, column A will reflect these funds have been received in full, so you won't see any current year activity for future uh, budgets. Um, this was all received this fiscal year. So this will be a carryover amount. So we'll, we'll start and end each budget reflecting the amount left over for use. Um, on line three, we have interest income. This is the projected interest earned um, within the money market fund that it's, that, that it's held within. Um, the CFD bond on line uh, 13, this is comparable to last year. Um, and the only difference you'll see here is that versus uh, budgeting on a line by line basis, we have a contingencies line. And that's because these are variable costs, but we find our administrative expenses to be comparable to this fiscal year. Um, moving on to line 17, we have um, the Bob Lucas branch um, sort of absorbing the majority of these costs as they will begin, are there projected to begin renovations January, 2023. The primary focus will be its construction costs and design. The main library costs are primarily related to permits and design since the main library won't be seeing uh, the renovation activity happen this, this upcoming fiscal year. In terms of capital reserves on line 25, we're projecting a drawdown of 3.735 million. Um, and that would leave 17.8 million remaining for use in future years. Um, moving on to page 120, this is our CFD fund uh, for our special tax lien. 
on line two, you'll see that this is revenue related to the property taxing to be recognized this fiscal year. Um, and on line six, you'll see the debt service interest. This is bond interest expenses um, attributable to the current fiscal year at a 5% rate. Um, so to sum up in terms of the fiscal impact, uh, general funds was originally projected at a $19,000 drawdown. Given the workers' compensation savings are anticipated to see, we're actually looking at a five to $6,000 increase in reserves. Um, in terms of donations and grants, we plan to fully utilize all funding um, and funding is right now projected at $289,000 um, sourced from uh, Friends of the Library, Altadena Library Foundation, Expanding Our Footprint and Emergency Connectivity Fund. Um, capital Projects Fund, we, we anticipate a drawdown of 3.735 million and all related toward renovations of both libraries and CFD special taxing, we expect a $369,000 um, increase in reserves. And that sums up the budget for this year. I'm happy to address any questions that may have come up. Great, thank you, Anna. Colleagues, questions of Anna or Nikki? Katie? So not so much a comment as it's not a comment, it's a question, or it's not a question, it's a comment. Um, I just want, we said this during the budget committee, but I wanted to say it again. I really appreciate the way you've set up this budget. I feel like it's so much easier to figure out what's where and how funds are going to specific places. And, you know, if somebody is donating money, where that money is being used, I just, I really appreciate the format. And I think it, it helps us be more transparent, but it also helps us make smart choices about how we're, how we're allocating funds. So thank you so much for that. Thank you. Terry? Yeah, I would agree. That's a very, a very tidy budget with a lot of good improvements on it. So thanks for that. And I do have a question. And, and I, forgive me if I'm being naive or you know, uninformed on this, but when you look at the expenditures for a capital project expenses, $2.5 million for Bob Lucas and a million dollars for the main library, are those based on building schedules right now or you know, what we kind of think we're going to spend on that? Where do those numbers come from? Those numbers came from Rockland Partners, our project management team. So we recruited their help in terms of what they foresee in terms of the timeline okay. of these renovations and costs. So we we did recruit their help um, just because they're they're closer to the project. Okay. It looks like such nice, even numbers. I thought yeah. somebody was <laughs> throw a card at it and say, okay, let's put those in. All right, thank you. Yeah, no problem. Well, and if I can as well, I'll just say that if we stay on the kind of projected schedule we're on, we would be looking at starting construction at Bob Lucas somewhere in the early part of 2023, which means only half, like we'd only hit a little bit of a fiscal year, right? So a lot of the bidding and stuff, I, I, I think that that 2.5 number for, for Bob Lucas might even be, I, these are high is what I'm saying, because we would be incurring more of those costs for Bob Lucas in the following fiscal year. That makes sense. Any other questions or comments? Okay, seeing none. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more with uh, what Katie indicated about the, the way this budget has been presented and the level of transparency we're providing. It's, uh, it really lays out nicely in, in disaggregating uh, the grants and expenditures, and we can really showcase uh, the, the different uh, uses, which is fantastic. So I really appreciate the attention to detail and the great work the Budget Committee did to uh, work with staff to get this to where it is now. So. That being said, uh, if there are no further questions, then we look for a motion to approve the budget uh, as presented for the 2023 fiscal year. Can I get a motion? So moved. Thank you, Camila. May I get a second? I'll second. Please. Thank you. <laughs> All right, we'll take the budget uh, to a vote. Trustee Andrus. Terry, look. You're muted. I think Terry, you're muted. Terry, Terry I'm muted. having nothing but trouble. Can you hear me now? Yes, we okay, gotcha. Well, my, my vote is aye, and I apologize. Thank you. 
Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. Trustee Wilkerson. Aye. Great. And that's an aye vote for me. The uh, the budget for next fiscal year is approved as presented. Thank you, Rotana. Thank you, Nikki, and all the staff that put uh, a lot of work into this. So appreciate it. All right. Next on our agenda is the uh, review and approval of the updated Alton Library District financial policy, which begins on page 121 of your packet. Nikki? All right, good evening. So excited to be bringing the updated financial policies to the board. This has been a goal of mine, as I told the budget committee since I started, which was two and a half years ago now. So last year we tackled the personnel policies, which was great. But this year I reached out to Ied Bailey and said, help please, like we need to update these. It's been since 2009. And uh, that's when I was introduced to Christy Even, who's done a lot of work on financial policy updating. She did take what we had before and poor thing, it was in PDF format and she had to convert to Word. And any of you that's had to do that know what a nightmare the formatting challenges can be. But we didn't provide a redline copy as I told the budget committee because it would have almost all been redlined. It's been a long time since we updated them. So we had several meetings with her, Anna, Christy, Ian and I, and then presented these updated policies to the budget committee who is recommending approval. The biggest difference in my opinion is that we had a lot of procedural information in the old policy, like a chart of accounts and things that like shouldn't have to come to the full board if we're ever changing them or editing or updating. So now it's just strictly like policies that can back up the decisions we make around finance. So Christy's here if you have any questions, but I think they're pretty straightforward. And again, the budget committee reviewed these as well. So happy to answer any questions. Right. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for bringing this uh, forward. It's like I said, it's long overdue. I appreciate your diligence to make sure this finally got done. So. Uh, colleagues, questions, comments? No? No? Going once? We, we wore you guys all out now, huh? <laughs> no, well, we're, sa we're saving our energy for the next couple of items. Just wait. Community board policy is going to be intense. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll just say that we... Um, we did go through these uh, in the budget committee meeting, and I, I think they're really great. And I also think that, you know, they will include now the unfunded liability policy as well. And one of the big goals that I know we've had as a district is just to provide guidance to future boards and future directors. Um, as, as many of us have experienced the exciting um, challenge of trying to do stuff in a vacuum when it's like, how was this done before? What were the criteria for making choices? How did you get that figured out? So the more we, you know, the more we're able to kind of put these norms and, and best practices in place, I think the better. So this is a huge achievement. And I know it's been on the radar for many years. And it's, it's really exciting to see it come together. So, all right, may I get a motion to approve the financial policies as presented? So moved. May I get a second? I will second. Thank you, Jason. All right, we'll take them out. Well, so first of all, uh, are there any other discussions or questions on this? Seeing no more discussion, we'll take this to a vote. Uh, Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. And an aye vote for me. Thank you very much. The, the policy is now approved. Thank you very much. All right. Next on our agenda is to review the Elton Library District Community Board Policy. Starting on page 151. Nikki? Uh, I'm going to pass the baton to Assistant Director Ashley Watts, who put this together for us tonight. Good evening again, board. Um, so this is pretty straightforward. Um, basically, we needed to update the policy to make sure we were including um, just some guidance for staff around things we would not want on the community board. We had started to get um, more requests now that people are moving towards holding more in-person events and more gatherings and just 
there were some questionable um, events that came across um, our purview and we just decided it was best to update the policy. So mainly I just included more specifics around um, some things we wouldn't showcase um, like religious events or events that um, are soliciting for some kind of membership or payment of something to be a part of it. That's just not um, things we would want to share. And what I did was I looked at a few other libraries policy um, for their boards and I kind of just made sure we were in alignment with what other libraries were doing. Great, thank you for that, Ashley. Any questions, comments from uh, trustees? Yes, Katie. I got a quick question. So, um, I'm I'm assuming based on my reading of this policy that this is about the physical board, right? Where like you put up flyers and stuff, and you're like, I can teach guitar lessons, or well, but not anymore because you can't do services. Um, but things like that, right? We're having a Shakespeare in the Park or whatever it is. Um, do we have similar kinds of policies for the community event calendar submissions, which I know are on the website somewhere. I don't know if that's still a functioning piece of the website, but at one point we had a, a thing where you could submit an event to the community events calendar and it would show up. Does this have, does this policy, I guess what I'm asking, have any bearing on that or is that a totally separate thing or is it defunct or what's going on there? No, it looks like this policy, um, when it began, was just for the community board. And so okay. I just kept it, kept the guidelines surrounding that. Okay. Um, I don't believe we have a policy in place for the submission of the events. I think people have just been submitting those. And okay. then um, the staff member who received those requests kind of comes through them. Um, but I'm not aware of a policy for it. Okay. That's fine. I'm just curious. Thanks. Colleagues, any other questions or comments of Ashley? Okay, seeing none, may I get a motion to approve the uh, community board policy as presented? I move we approve the community board policy. Great. Thank That's you, Terry. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, we'll take the oh, any further discussion on the matter? Nope. Okay, seeing none. Take the matter to a vote. Trustee Andrews? Aye. Trustee Capel? Aye. Trustee Clark? Aye. Trustee Wilkerson? Aye. Great. And that's an aye vote for me. Great. And that matter is approved. Thank you very much, Ashley. Appreciate your presentation and your work. All right. Next on our agenda is a review and discussion of the land acknowledgement implementation. It's on page 154 of your board package. Nikki? Yeah, so um, as you're all aware, I believe it was in February that the board voted to approve our land acknowledgement statement. There's both the long statement as well as the shorter statement. I do realize that we didn't start the meeting tonight with um, the land acknowledgement. It is in the agenda, which is where it will live, but we wanted to bring this back to the board and in the, in the package, you can see, we just included the long and the short statement around getting some direction from you in terms of how you would like to implement that at board meetings, committee meetings, because the budget committee did read it at the beginning of their meeting as well, um, just to provide some direction to us around how we would like to implement that moving forward. Colleagues, comments, questions? I, mean, I feel weird I mean, I, I don't know everybody's background, but I think it just feels weird to be having like making decisions and having a discussion on this without any like, at least in my feeling, any real input from the local indigenous community. And I personally don't, I know of some individuals, I'm not aware, aware of any at least hyper local organizations or whatnot. So my personal opinion would be I would, I would like to see if, you know, if we could identify any local organizations and try to find a way to build a relationship. Um, because as I brought up in our facilities committee as well, I, you know, if I think there's some opportunities with 
what we're looking to do uh, with the libraries and there, there will be opportunities maybe we haven't even thought of when we get deeper into these projects, but none of that makes sense if we don't have direct input from the local indigenous community. So I'm just, I, I feel like we need to try and make that connection before we make any further decisions. I, I will I will point out that we did have like we actually paid um, a consultant from an, an indigenous person to help us write mm -hmm. the, the statements themselves. So I mean if um, if you'd like, I guess we could reach back out to see like I could ask, ask them to come to a meeting or um, so like we did get um, feedback and approval on the statements that are presented to you. So I guess for me, it's like, do we want to agree that we read a, the shorter statement, we include the long statement in the agenda? Um, Nikki, I guess did we not already approved approve the, length, the, the language, the short version, the long version, when that was presented we, we uh, did. About four, four months ago? So yeah, so we had an in-depth discussion uh, with the with the with the assistance of, of the consultant, um, Jason, were, are you are you thinking that perhaps we should reconsider what's been presented in this report? Because I believe no. this is what was previously approved. It's more of I want to make sure we're doing something real, right? Like I mean, I I voted yes on this motion because I didn't. I don't. I don't, I'm, I don't I'm not against reading a statement, but I just I feel like. I think I asked the question then it's like okay now and what next right mm -hmm. like I, I feel like it's it's almost disingenuous if we're just reading this little short statement and not taking any kind of concrete steps as far as you know recognition and reconciliation so um th that's my main feedback I mean as far as you know what we do going forward until we make that connection I think having the full statement posted um and reading the short statement is fine, but I, I do think more needs to be done to build that relationship. And, and I would hope it goes beyond a consultant. Like, I don't know mm -hmm. if that person is local, right? But I, I feel like building a relationship locally is important. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Camila, you have your hand up and then Katie, you're, you'll be next. Hi. Um was initially agreeing that, you know, we um, agreed on the statement, but I guess the question was like, how do we use the statement? And so I was wondering if, if Jason's question was related to like, do we want to engage that individual to share with us how to do so in a meaningful way? But then I heard him saying more in terms of um, not only how to utilize a statement in a meaningful way, but how do we, would, do they have any suggestions or feedback or um, not guidelines, but any like, here's what else you can do. Like maybe they have that um, and we can obtain that. But at the very least, I think it would be helpful to know um, how to, how this individual or the organization would suggest utilizing the statement. As far as what I think, I think that it should be posted as it is. And I think that it should be, I think it's simple enough to read for me, the long statement into the record. It takes, you know, it's, it's not a, a hardship. I think it, we can read it into the record at the start of um, any meeting. I think that the next thing to ask is if there is an event, um, how do we implement or how do we utilize the statement? Do we want to have the long statement or the short statement um, read into existence at an event? Um, and my, my opinion on that would be to just utilize the long statement in a meeting, any, any meetings and then also any events. Thank you, Camila. Katie? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I agree with all that. And I, I will say I'm aware of the um, background of the consultant the district used and, you know, her her connections with the, you know, local Tongva communities and a variety of folks who are, you know, making decisions about ways of engaging um, 
with a lot of these questions. And so I, I think she's not only super credible, but she's super tied into sort of the local on the ground situation with, um, with indigenous communities. And I think that's great. But I, I do think that, you know, both Jason and Camilla, I hear you saying what I feel as well, which is great, we can do this, but it feels totally insufficient um, as the end of the conversation. So what is the next step? What happens next? How are we activating this in a, in a real way at events, in the way we think about space, in the way we think about landscaping, in the way we think about, you know, communities we're serving. Um, you know, I don't, I don't have a strong opinion. I think that the short statement, um, I mean, I, I agree with Camila. I think it takes, you know, two more seconds to read the longer version and it kind of does the heavy lifting of, of foregrounding these issues. I don't, I don't know. The short statement to me feels like we may as well not bother, right? It, it's sort of like, Hey, this is a thing, but we don't want to talk about it. I, I think if we're going to legitimately engage with these questions, then we should legitimately engage with them and read the long thing. And I am embarrassed that we forgot to do it at the beginning of the meeting today. Um, but yeah, so I don't think we should have a short version. Uh, I think we should just have a long version. I think we should use it. And I think we should figure out if that's the, if that's the bare minimum, if that's the floor, then what are our, what are our steps from here? I do think there is some value in the short statement at like every time we have a children's program, a teen program, sure. adult program type of thing, like let's incorporate, but like um, just to acknowledge and, and start creating some awareness around that, you know? Um, but again, I, I agree. Like, so we have to start somewhere. And I wanted to talk to all of you about how that looks in terms of how we carry out meetings and events. Like for example, with the, with the pride event that is starting at the library, I'm gonna be making a statement and we're gonna use the long statement at the beginning of that program. So I think it's just gonna build upon itself. Um, I have been in touch with Tina about um, the renaming of Jackson as well. I'm on that, the renaming committee for the elementary school. So I do think like, all as we've talked right now, it's like maybe we engage around somebody be, be joining the community focus group, you know, and, and other things like that, where we're building in. Luckily, idea. you know, like Bridget's son, Levi, who does a lot of our gardening programming, like is very tapped into and connected to making sure that there's land acknowledgement, but also involvement whenever we can. But again, expanding that into the building projects, I think is really important. So yeah, and it's definitely on Ashley's radar. We're trying to figure out ways to incorporate that into programming and, and the services that we provide as well. So, but again, like not to make light of this, but I wanted it to be like a discussion with the board around how this is gonna look moving forward so that we're aware that this is what, how we're gonna start all of our meetings. Um, you know, uh, Nikki, uh, yeah. so to say, first of all, whoever started this meeting didn't read it into the record. I would be shot. So we'll take care of that. <laughs> that the, I, I, to, to, It'll be on to, our radar too, you know. To Jason's like, point, you know, would it make sense to what everyone's saying? Because we heard staff make the presentation. Uh, maybe, maybe other trustees heard from this person. At the very least, would it make sense just to have this person come and present or just have a conversation about this with the, the board to discuss one, the short version, the long version, but you know, from their perspective, I know that was in the report, but it's different when it's a staff presenting a written report and, and hearing from this person so we can have meaningful back and forth dialogue as far as what this means for them, the, the people they represent. And us and what we should be doing because you know reading something into the record is it we can have it on the agenda it's it's nice but it's kind of hollow just because you know it's just gonna be after a while it's gonna be sped red and it's like okay check we've done that next so there's something more to it that we need to perhaps consider beyond just the side of the short long version so I, I guess I'm in agreement with everyone and I'm okay you know at least having everyone read the long version at the beginning of every single uh, meeting that we have uh, while maybe continuing this dialogue and starting off with the consultant perhaps 
Katie, you had a thought? Well, I was just going to say, I think that's a really important um, point, Rushmore. And I, I also wonder if, um, you know, like a lot of what we have to do as a public agency, especially in like public meetings, right, is constrained by the Brown Act and parliamentary procedure and all these other things. But I feel like this is an area where we can do something that we feel like has some merit and some meaning and some importance. And especially because of the ways in which like representatives of elected American democracy have interacted with indigenous communities, I would like to see us do something particularly at public meetings, right? I think that that's really important. Um, and I don't know what that looks like, but I think that there's probably a, a good discussion in the same way that we think about like, you know, who we name buildings after and all of that kind of, all that kind of stuff. I think that this is an important kind of question for us to think about um, as sort of the public elected face of a, of an agency. Sure. So, Mickey, uh, we could, now are you looking, this is for discussion at this point, we can decide we want to go with the longer short version um, as far as ensuing meetings. Um, but I think what you're hearing at the very least, have a conversation with the consultant, have her, him or her come and to have, have a discussion, not, you know, not necessarily, you know, read us a report, what, what does this mean? And what, 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 what do they envision? What do we, so help us understand, because, you know, unless you're fully in, engrossed in this subject matter, I mean, all you know is what's before you as far as what you're supposed to read into the record and, and not much more. So maybe maybe that's a start. Um, and then we can decide thereafter what that looks like as far as, you know, programming, naming, whatever the case may be as it relates to the library. Um, but in my capacity right now, I'm more than happy to read the long, long statement into the record prior to every meeting. And I think everyone here would respectively agree to do so uh, for the committees as well. It doesn't take that much effort, but it, again, I think that I think we're all saying the same thing. It seems a little hollow, just going to speed read through this and it's like, what else is there? So um, not that you need an action, but I think I, I would suggest we all, that from this point forward, all meetings begin with a long statement and you know, we can decide to uh, amend after our conversation with the consultant if this person's available um, and, and then talk about what that means before a meeting, but what it really means more importantly from a pro programmatic and a messaging and, and a perspective longer term for the, for the library district. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll initiate a conversation for sure. Um, okay, Terry, you have you have your hand up, please. Well, just uh, I'll chime in here. I just don't feel connected to it. Is my problem. I don't know where it came from, and I don't know much about the genesis of this. And you know, there, I guess, I mean, there's lots of ethnicities and races and and segments of people that have been maligned by the U.S. government and. I, I just don't know how, and, and I'm not, I'm really not trying to be brood about this, but I don't know how this was, how, how this came to us, if you know what I mean. I just don't feel any any connection to it. I would certainly read it if it became our policy. I don't have a problem with that. But uh, I guess maybe for me, a uh, part of the change in my attitude might be knowing a little bit more about it. And you suggested having some sort of a presentation or something that would help me out. Yeah. It's almost a personal thing for me. No, Terry, there's nothing wrong with your position. It's just who, who you, how you how you feel. And it's, it's not, not right or wrong. And I, I think that it, it, one could easily have that opinion if you have no idea and then you had a presentation from a staff person says so well we we heard from a consultant this, and this is what we should be doing but it doesn't give you any context you're not hearing from rep a representative representatives from that group and and you know also you know what, what what's going on around the country to acknowledge this as well so this you know i think that a little more meat on the bones would perhaps help it resonate for all of us beyond just entering, uh, you know, committing to a statement. Because I think that we're all kind of at some level of really not knowing what to do with this. The statement is the easy part. 
the harder part is what do we do next but you know some it could be for you terry and, and maybe others but this is like why are we even doing this in the first place so and it it it, it could run the scale of you know one to ten where we are as far as understanding we're all somewhere in between but i think that what we didn't have was that 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 conversation with a representative that that expert and kind of have that conversation and kind of enlighten all of us so we can get our, our, our you know our heads around this and and in and, the and maybe we're not on all the same page and that's okay too but you know at least we're, we know we'll hear what the trends are and what you know what what uh representatives from this particular cohort uh believes should be done at the very least and what possibly could be done in the future at the reprogramming or whatever the case may be down the line is that good with you terry yeah yeah just a little something i mean if you want to proceed with a vote on this, you know, I, I will accept the outcome no matter what it is. But uh, yeah, I don't know this a vote necessarily. I just think that from this point forward, I mean, we all agree that we're just going to move forward, read the long version, and you know, and Nikki and staff will remind all of us before every meeting this, hey, remember, you got to read this into the record. And but you know, understanding that we want to have a further you know progressive conversation about this this topic and you know we we live in a unique community of Altina that's as you you know and you know and we have a unique community and why not have a unique perspective on on something that's very important to to the history of this area as a point of order if i may i just suggest that we put it in the agenda because having <laughs> when you're when you're running the meeting, you look at the agenda and you're like, okay, yeah. call to order. Yeah. Da, 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 da. Just stick it in there. Stick it in that first yeah, uh, actually, section. And actually, it was on the agenda here. I just I just blew oh, was right it? Past it. That's embarrassing. I didn't even look. Yeah. No, no, no. I mean yeah. in the open session like piece. You know what yeah, I mean? No, like it, roll it, call, it, land acknowledgement. Yeah. No, it's it's approval yeah, it's, there. it should be yeah, on the agenda, but yeah, it's but if you uh, the first page of the uh the agenda, it's 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 there. I, I know it is. I'm saying in the in the course of the, sure. the sequence oh, yeah. of things, uh, like yeah, item two B. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Yeah, I'm I'm uh, as far yeah as far as moving forward uh, for all agendas. Yes, I agree. That would certainly make sure we don't forget as well. All right. Okay. Yeah, definitely we'll do. We'll add that. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all for your thoughts on that matter. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, next item on the agenda is the uh, update on the uh, district vaccination policy. So um, again, this is just informational. Um, last month when the board voted to just amend section four, I believe it was, uh, asked me to bring it back so you guys could at least see what the adjustment looked like. So we're just providing it as informational, happy to answer any questions. So basically what that means is I'm continuing to keep track of who's vaccinated, who's boosted and uh, adhering to the guidelines based on that. Because currently we update our COVID prevention plan. If someone's exposed to COVID, but they're not boosted, we have to respond differently than those that are not boosted or are or are not vaccinated. So I'm continuing to keep track of all of that. We just have suspended weekly testing of staff so colleagues any questions of katie regarding the revised policy no okay seeing none thank you very much for that update let's go to the next item so review and approval of the resolution 2022-08 to extend the provisions of resolution 2021-05 authorizing remote tele teleconferencing meetings of the legislative bodies of the altina library district for the period of june 1st to June 30th of 2022. Any uh, discussion or thoughts on this? No? Okay, may I get a motion to approve? Can I just ask, like... Sure, yeah. I mean, I, I'm just, my own, just needing feedback from folks, I guess. Like, I feel like we're, like, we're doing everything public in the libraries except our board meetings right now. And I, in my head, I don't, I can't make sense of that like you know what i mean like we had 180 people in the library for second saturday like i mean i've never seen more than 15 people at a board meeting it, it just doesn't it, i guess it just doesn't make sense to me 
you know, Jason, uh, I, we are right now, um, while the state of California has still a uh, emergency declaration for COVID, um, that the, the district had decided to honor the state's state of emergency. And once that's lifted, it was discussed, then, then we would then meet. Um, if there is a desire of this body to reconsider that position, and I don't know if it was voted on because I came into this already pre-cooked, if, if there's a prevailing uh, feeling that we, sh we could pivot and move in a different direction and start meeting in person, I'm happy to have that discussion as well. Our colleagues, any thoughts? I don't think we're bound, Nikki. I mean, I think that was a, I think maybe, or maybe Katie, you're aware where there was a something the board approved. I, I'm just inheriting this, so I don't know the genesis of of the uh, adherence to the state. Yeah, I think the fairest. I think the fairest way to say it is that the provisions of the uh, governor's emergency order and the sort of special circumstances of the Brown Act allowing teleconferencing are permitted as long as the state of emergency persists, they're not required. So it's a voluntary, you know, thing. Okay. And so I'm hearing at least one member of the, of the board of trustees that's would like to entertain meeting in person. Uh, are there others that perhaps would be interested in doing so as well? I'm okay. I missed, that, I, I missed that question, Rush Marshall. Did you repeat that? I said, uh, it, it, I, I'm asking, it's getting, it's getting a straw poll from the board whether there is an interest in deviating from prior uh decisions to begin meeting in person versus doing these meetings remotely well i can speak, speaking for myself when i'd like to get together in person that's i think the, the quality of meetings is improved by that plus our rapport and our interaction but i've been dealing with a member of my family who has an immunocompromised system and so there was a medical reason for me to sort of keep my distance but that's starting to wane now so there will be a point in time for me going forward where i would like to get together with the board in person and that could, that could be soon for me so that's where i stand on this i'm okay with the zoom calls as well but i do think getting together is a good way to go well, you have any i'm also i'm also okay with it i think that we can discuss how to do so in a safe way, um, but there has, I think there has to be discussion and planning on that. Like what specifically it would look like, like members of the public shall stay, you know, 15 feet behind this yellow line or whatever it looks like, but I think that it's a possibility and I'm, I'm okay with it either way. Okay, thank you for that Camila and everyone's perspective. Um, One thing's for sure, I, th I think you would all agree that if we were going to meet in person, it would have to be all in person. I, I really couldn't see a hybrid. I mean, I guess you could technically do that, but I, I would really want all of us to be there versus, you know, three of the five being in person, the other two, I you know, zoom, zooming in. I, I just, it, it breaks up the continuity. And, you know, I'd like to think we're all at a point where at some point we're all comfortable doing this. And Terry, whatever the, your situation may be, you know, maybe in a few months it, or maybe next month, I don't know. And, um, you know, I'm not sure where, where everyone else is, but we'd have to actually agree that I think personally that we should all be on the same page as far as wanting to meet in person. And I want to respect people's position for whatever the reason is that they feel like they're still uncomfortable to to meet in person but at some point i think that you know obviously we're going to be meeting in person it's just a matter of if it's next month or you know three months from now but at some point you know i think that it, it's you know it's important for all of us to, to reconvene and, and have a you know meaningful discussions in person because i think that's 
I think, you know, meetings and, and suffer because you're not in person. You don't have that level of collaboration. So um, I think that's kind of where we are now. Even, um, Jason, I know you brought the, brought the subject up. It sounds like we still may have one or more of the, of the five of us that may not be in a position right now to feel comfortable. Um, I think, again, I'm speaking just personally, and it's just may not be the collective uh, opinion of the group that I think I would like to have everyone there versus just one or two not being there. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And I, I, I mean, I really just brought it up because, you know, ha, you know, having been the presenter and the host for second Saturday, I'm just personally kind of struggling with you know, how do we justify to our constituents that we're meeting by Zoom, yet everything else in the library is like gone back to person, right? And I just, I feel, I just wanted us, like, I feel like we need to start having that conversation because more and more and more is moving back to in person. And it, I, yeah, you know, like the community is going to start seeing that and yeah. kind of wondering. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. I, you know, personally, I struggle with myself as well. So no, I'm there with you. So, um, and I understand the city of Los Angeles, not that that's a bit barometer, but they just recently started meeting in person now. Yeah. Their city council meetings now, just recently as well. So and it, it, it's right. being done all over the place. So I think it's, it's, it's coming soon and, and you know i you know next month this time next month i'd like to have a more frank discussion kind of check and see where we are because as opposed to rubber stamping this and so i you know because i feel like I, the last time this came up i brought it up and everyone, everyone's taking a turn to bring this up but i think that this next go, next month i think that we should have a candid discussion where are we you know how yeah. soon can we can we collectively move forward because i'm personally ready but i've been ready for a long time but that's just me and everyone has a different perspective so so um, so in the meantime, look, I recommend we, we pass this as, as we have in the past. And then when we have this items up for, uh, for discussion, you know, let's, let's have, let's have a, you know, candid discussion where we are individually, um, personally, as far as ready to move forward. It's reasonable. Sound good? And I, I think that also there might be some room also for a discussion around, you know, some of the positive impacts of remote capabilities in the sense that like not every person, not like every citizen has the time to come to an in-person meeting, but there's, you know, there are people who are working, who are parents, whatever, and maybe there are some ways we can, you know, preserve the ability to like make public comment, for example, via Zoom. Um, I, I think that there are some, some real accessibility and, and participatory advantages to some of the technology we've learned how to get real good at. And I'd like us to, I'd like to see us think about ways we can retain some of those advantages. I'm glad you brought that up because actually I had always, I didn't articulate, but I've always kind of a vision once we went back, we, I was never, ever, ever met all four of you in person. In one meeting. <laughs> True. Uh, to actually meet, uh, have meetings, but still afford the opportunity for constituents to participate via Zoom if they have a public comment or whatnot. So yeah, it's, it's I think that'd be great. Preserve that, preserve that, that, uh, that option on a go forward basis. So yeah. great. Okay. Uh, that being said, may I get a motion for uh, item H, please? So moved. Great. Second. May I get a second? Great. Thank you very much. We'll take that matter. Well. Any further discussion? Seeing none, I'll take it to a vote. Trustee Andrews. Aye. Trustee Capel. Aye. Trustee Clark. Aye. Trustee Wilkerson. Aye. And an aye vote for me. Thank you very much. All right, now we are on to uh, governance, discussion of board elections outreach. Nikki. So as you are all aware, um, we have three open seats this year. Uh, the research that we've done, and Katie, please correct me. I think you can start filing June 18th to run for office. I I love government. Sorry, agencies. July July 18th. July. July 18th. So it's only a couple weeks. I thought it it's was a month. That. Am I wrong? Oh Is gosh. it June 18th? Wait, I have the calendar here. Hang on, I'm gonna look it up. I was I mean, searching through the website and I couldn't even easily find it. I mean, I, I don't want to criticize another government. No, no, no. But but I struggled. And that's why we haven't put much information out yet because like the websites aren't updated. We can't update the PowerPoint that you guys used the last time because the sites aren't up yet. Anyway. Yeah, it's um 
Wait. Yeah, exactly. From the county. So that's the problem. Hang on. <laughs> uh, I gotta call them. I maybe it's. Is it the is the county uh, recorder or the, yes. or the county yeah. clerk? Yeah. County clerk's office. All right. Yeah. Office, so it's yeah. it's just very very un user unfriendly is the way I would put it. Bryn and I were digging. We've updated what we can, but long story short, the deadline to file I believe is August twelfth. That I'll double true. check those dates, um, but we need to get the word out that we have three open seats. Uh, I we di I did ask Catalina at the beginning of May to send all of you a list of all the May events, which she did. We'll continue to do that at the beginning of, of each month, so we'll get June out as soon as possible. I do think like when the trustees can attend events and talk about what you do and spread the word, I think that will only create in, you know, awareness about serving on the board. Thank you to Rushmore and all of you for submitting, getting to know your, your trustees. Those were put on the website the day after they were sent. So I don't know if you guys noticed, but if you go onto the board of trustees page under your picture, there's a link and they get to see your more informal photo and get to know more about you. You mean and, the day and after Jason plan. finally turned his in? Uh, yes, that is true. <laughs> <laughs> um, I but didn't again, know they I, were there. They are. Check it out. Oh, fun. Okay. So fun. Yeah. And and I want to have a robust board election page. It, again, we're just really struggling to have all the resources needed. We are planning to post the how to run for office that Katie and Jason, like, I think the information is all still very good. I watched the video a couple of weeks ago. But again, I just wanted to, like, talk to you guys about getting the word out because... It's three open seats. Uh, I'm hoping all of my current trustees are going to be running again, but <laughs> we'll see how it goes. So um, I would have liked to have more concrete information to share, but again, like struggling. Yeah. So I can confirm that the filing period is July 18th through August 12th. So that's the nomination period. Um, so that's, that is correct. Okay. So there you go. <laughs> it's so weird. So it's only a couple of weeks. That is, that's a very short turnaround time, but leading up to that, so two years ago when Katie and Jason prepared this video, it was on the website, but it was I mean, shown in any event that possible. And, and how was this, was this word of mouth, I guess, the, the, the board of trustees at every public meeting at inviting people to run? Is that pretty much the, the outreach? No, like, well, the video they put together, it's on our YouTube page on the website, um, is just like the, the basics of how to run for office and everything included, as well as like how to manage your financing, what you need to file and where, you know, like all the things that they wished when they were running, people had told them ahead of time. Right, right. It's like an you hour know? long. It's like a whole, it's like a whole webinar. Yeah, like, it's an hour. The, Here's this right. form and here's that form and here's what you do sure. and all that dress campaign finance. And, and yeah, and we wanted to post the the presentation they used, which is excellent too, but like the websites have changed. So we wanted to update with yeah. current images. Mm -hmm. um, so people know, you know, cause a lot of people are visual. This is what it should look mm -hmm. like, but the websites aren't updated yet or available for people to do so. Okay. So I'll continue, I'll continue to work with Katie cause I'm sure she'd be happy to help me update as needed but like again yeah. the more the, we can the, the word yeah. the better it's tough and, and the reason it's so it's so rough is because the june ballot is june 7th so like a lot of the things that will be on the november ballot come out of that so like that's why it's mm -hmm. the way it is but yeah it's they're very, you know what i'm having it's like okay. I'm like having deja vu to the bond issuance. Oh, like right. Every, yeah. No, absolutely. everybody's going to be like, why didn't you tell us? And I'll be like, yeah, I couldn't. Right. there was no right. information. But I mean, like, I think the more we can just spread the word that like, there's three open seats. Like, if people are interested, they should run, direct them to me, I can answer questions. Like, I could have them talk to Terry or Camila who aren't running this year. You know what I mean? Like, so anyway, I don't know what else I was supposed to say about this tonight. No, I was just, no, I was just reminding everyone it's coming and just kind of figure out how we can get the word out at these public meetings talking about it. And, and I guess, you know, with even 
do we want to send something out to the members of the friends? Uh, I'm not sure what kind of emails could go out to, or members of, of the town council. They, they know somebody passed the word along. I mean, maybe sending a, a, a mass email out to these the various, I mean, or even our, our you know, library card holders. I don't know if that's allowed or not. I mean, uh, well, we do, we do have Altadena connections. We could do it there. Yeah. I, yeah, I think we can promote the fact that like there's a board election coming up. But again, I don't want to do it too soon in that they'll forget by the time they can file. Like I, I had planned on talking about it at the town council meeting because they meet the third Tuesday of every month. This month I didn't because I felt like it's two months away. So I'll definitely yeah. talk about it in June. I'll talk about it again in July just to keep it up front of mind. And it was good because this month I talked about the notice of special tax lien because a lot of them I don't know if they knew, but it, just in case people start calling town council members, they were aware that the mailer went out and they could refer people to me. So I'm definitely open to thoughts, yeah. feedback, reach yeah. out to me and spread the word. Cause I think that's right. all we can really do right well, now. And, and from this point forward, if, when you get any complaints via email or phone calls, what not says, well, about not knowing what's going on. So like, great. Well, I need you to run for a board seat so you can be informed and let other people know. Whatever it takes. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quote you on that, Rushmore. Okay. <laughs> Back. Back. All right. Uh, any other thoughts on this matter? Okay. I, I, quick thought for me. Am I on? Okay, good. Um, I tried to, I, I've had such trouble with my computer tonight, but uh, I tried to work the room at the chamber dinner the other night and get it out there. And a couple of little, little openings uh, that I could pursue. One would be an appearance at the Rotary Club. They'd like to get me interested in that anyway. So I might follow up with a cauliflower and see if I can get a seat at one of their breakfasts or lunches coming up, Nikki. Uh, and I don't Any, know anytime I, you want to come, Terry, say the word. Are you at those all the time yourself? We're, well, we're a, an institutional member, so we go every week. Okay. Like I, I spread the love. Ashley goes, I go. Bridget's going for us this week. If the trustees ever want to go, Say the word because we, okay, well, you can it's a me. weekly meeting on Thursdays at noon. Okay. <laughs> That's a good idea. Like maybe you could be the presenter to talk about the board yeah. election. So well, yeah. that was the one that mentioned it. I thought, oh, well, sure. Mm -hmm. It's a really good idea. Yeah. 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 And you'd be a good one because again, you don't have an open seat right now. So we'll, we'll get that on their calendar for sure. That's a good idea. I will have one more years for you, Terry. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I will add one more thing, a personal experience, and that was I went to Serving with a Purpose, that thing the other day out in Ontario with Nikki and Bridget, and Catalina was there too. And I had a breakout room full of trustees, library trustees from all over Southern California. There's probably 25 people in there. And I felt so uh, good about being a board member on the or on board of trustees for the Altadena Library District because everybody else, all these other trustees, were serving for city governments and so on. They didn't have really a say in anything. They were the biggest complaint of this whole group is that all they do is rubber stamp stuff. They never get a chance to make any meaningful uh, difference or contributions. And I thought that was really interesting. Interesting. It made me really value this seat a lot more than I guess I otherwise would. So it's it's a quality position, you know, and I think if people start to know that they might be more interested. There you go. My soapbox, I'm off of it now. Yeah. It's uh, nothing but fun, right guys? All yeah. fun. Yeah. <laughs> and that's our 8 30 closing time. Exactly. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, okay. So that being said, uh, shall we move on? The uh, announcements and planning correspondence. Uh, any uh, future agenda items? No? All right. All right. Uh, any, uh, do we, uh, any objection to adjourning this meeting at 8 23? No? Uh, seeing none. Another uh, seven here's... minutes. Let's just do, you know, a nice round. Yeah, let's just let's talk. Let's, yeah, let's, yeah. <laughs> maybe Terry. Maybe Terry knows a song he could sing us. There you go. Come on, let's just throw some jokes. No. 
Uh, thank you very much, all of you, for uh, this very long evening. I thought we had some very productive conversations and uh, moving the bar forward and looking forward to uh, next month. But thank you very much for your time. Uh, right. Nikki, thank you for you and your staff for sticking it out and for the, uh, the comprehensive reports as usual. Job well done. So uh, I will now consider this meeting adjourned at uh, 824. Good night, good night, everyone. Thanks very much, everybody. Thanks. Good night. Have a good night. Yeah. San Marino's zip code is 91108.